Blaze Blue is a series made up of fast-paced combat, incredibly unique mechanics, tons of single-player content, an instantly memorable art style, and a fan base that truly does love every nook and cranny of it and will support the game for years to come. But that's what we covered in part one of this retrospective. Yes, folks, this is part two of the Blaze Blue retrospective, and you might be thinking, well, if you covered all of that in part one, what's left to talk about in part two? Oh, right, that. We might want to just go ahead and play that intro, because this is going to be a long one. and welcome to part two of the Blaze Blue Retrospective. In case you missed part one, you can find the card for it popping up right now. Go ahead and check it out, but I will warn you, this isn't going to be like any other multi-part fighting game retrospective we've ever done. Normally, when we have to divide a retrospective up, it's because we're covering everything in chronological order and there's just too much to fit into one video. But not here. In part one, we already covered all the games, their development, their mechanics, their reception. We covered pretty much everything. Although, I should address two issues with that first video right here at the top. Number one, at the end of the video, I mentioned that the future of Blaze Blue is up in the air right now, after the game's creator, Mori P, left Arc System Works. Uh, spoiler if you haven't watched that first video yet. And while we still don't know what Arc Systems has planned for this game's future, I did imply that the new roguelike game that was in development might currently be in some trouble because we haven't heard anything about that game ever since Mori P left the company, but since that very first video went up, some brand new footage of the game was revealed, letting us know that yes, it is indeed still coming out, so hey, that's actually some good news. We still don't know if Arc Systems is going to give them another fighting game anytime in the future, but they are at least still willing to let other companies make smaller titles around it. So it looks like for now, the franchise will get to continue on in some way, shape, or form. And the other big correction I have to make for part one, and this one I am truly embarrassed about... I called the x Blaze games light novels? They are not light novels, they are visual novels. Folks, I wish I could say this was the first time I got those two things mixed up, but it isn't, and it's not going to be the last. For some reason, I always think light novels are games and visual novels are books with pictures in them. I don't even know how that got in my head, it's just been that way for years. So yes, I have to apologize, I should not have said that x Blaze Lost Memories was a bad light novel, I should have said that was a bad visual novel. Just the worst visual novel I've ever played, truly a horrible, horrible visual novel. Whew. There. Hope that cleared everything up, glad I got that off my chest, do not play x Blaze Lost Memories. So, as I was saying, normally we cover everything about these games in chronological order, but in part one of the Blaze Blue retrospective, we left out a very important part. The story. And that's because the story of Blaze Blue is its own separate beast. Blaze Blue's story is incredibly important to the series, being larger than any other fighting game story, and for many people it's the main draw of the game, so I have to cover it. Unfortunately, the story of Blaze Blue is more blue than a hot air balloon and more complicated than reading Gravity's Rainbow Backwards. 
So I realized early on when working on this retrospective that if I tried to talk about that while covering the gameplay and the development and everything else, it would make the video a jumbled mess. It would be like if you were on a road trip and every couple of miles you had to keep stopping at the nearest library to study for a physics exam. It would just break the entire flow of the video and would make it way too hard to keep all that information in your head at once. So instead, I decided to split the story discussion off into its own video, and that's what we're doing today. And I know some people might think I'm exaggerating about the story being complicated, so before we begin, I just want to make it clear... No, I am not! Blaze Blue's story isn't just the longest in any fighting game, it's also one of the most incomprehensive stories in any game, period. And that doesn't mean it's bad, no, not at all. This story certainly isn't bad, but it is complicated. And before we start delving into it, I feel we need to address why that is. I saw so many people after part one of the retrospective say that they wanted to check out these games, and that's great! But I know some of y'all probably went into these story modes and thought, what the heck is going on? So I feel we should actually address what makes this story so complicated to help you all understand it. But if you do just want to skip ahead to when we actually begin talking about the story proper, go ahead and jump to the time code shown below. Okay, for starters, the story of all Blaze Blue games takes place over the course of a few weeks. But there is a massive boatload of backstory to this world, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. And you need to know this backstory to understand anything that's going on. Problem is, they don't explain to you most of the backstory until after the parts of the story where you need to know the backstory. Secondly, Blaze Blue loves its made up nouns and verbs. There are so many names and places and special items and magical abilities, all of which have their own unique names. There are, as we said in part one, side modes that explain to you what many of these terms are. But yeah, you remember that metaphor I made earlier about going on a road trip where you had to keep stopping to study for an exam? That's kind of what this is. It's hard to keep all of that in your brain when you have to sit through a giant chunk of story, only to then unlock the side content that explains to you what part of what you just played means. And that's if they decide to explain to you this information in the game itself, because there is so much important information that is locked behind mangas, light novels, visual novels, phone games. Heck, I'm pretty sure that roguelike I mentioned is going to end up having some kind of important information that changes everything that we knew about this entire story and will poorly age this video the moment it comes out. So if you want to get into Blaze Blue and you play the core main fighting games and you just play those games, and you sit through every single part of that game and study every single bit of information that it gives you, you're still not gonna know what a chunk of this story is about. And lastly, and quite possibly the biggest roadblock to understanding the story of Blaze Blue, is that nothing in Blaze Blue can ever just be one thing. Over the course of making these videos, some big Blaze Blue fans contacted me and mentioned that this story had several rewrites. But as I worked my way through the games, I never really noticed any clear rewrites. There was only one or two instances I noticed where a character said something different from what we had seen in a previous game. But then it hit me. Oh, that's not the kind of rewrites this game has. No, the kind of rewrites that this game has are things like, Hey, remember that thing that happened in the last game? Remember how we said it happened because of A? Well, it also happened because of B, and C, and D, which were all happening at the exact same time as A. And also because of E and F, which happened years before the game began. In part one, I said Blaze Blue felt like that story that you came up with in your head in middle school, but instead of writing it down, you just kept adding on to it more and more as time went on. And yeah, it turns out that's exactly what happened. Now, I know some of y'all are wondering why I wanted to talk about the complexities of this story before going into it, and that's because I wanted to make something clear. Today, I'm going to explain to you the story of Blaze Blue, but I'm not going to cover the entire story of Blaze Blue. Yes, when I announced that I was going to be doing this retrospective, I had several fans contacting me saying, make sure to talk about this manga, make sure to talk about this book. Heck, I even had one person contacting me saying, I need to make sure to cover the backstories of Persona 4, Under Night and Birth, and Ruby, because Blaze Blue had a crossover with them. Which... No? When I do the Street Fighter retrospective later this year, I'm not going to stop when I get to Street Fighter Cross Tekken to explain the entire history of the Mishima family blood feud. I really hope that person was joking about that. 
But yes, I had many people tell me that I had to make sure to cover all the mangas in addition to the games, and believe me guys, I get it. They do each contain bits of information that are important, and I know that you're all very passionate about this series and you want to make sure that I cover all of it. I totally understand that. But do you know who else contacted me when I announced that I was going to be doing this retrospective? People who had never gotten into Blaze Blue because they found the lore and the story to be too intimidating. Yeah, I had several people telling me that they were excited for this retrospective because they always wanted to know what Blaze Blue was about, but it was just too much for them to tackle on their own. And that's who I'm making this video for today. Today I want to make a video that takes the massive, insane story of Blaze Blue and condenses it down into something that still captures all the important parts, includes all the vital information, but also makes it manageable and understandable for anyone, whether that be a longtime player, a brand new fan, or just someone on the outside who's always been curious. So in other words, I will not be covering any of the side content unless it is absolutely necessary to the main plot. If something happens in the story because of A, B, C, D, E, and F, but you only need to know about A, then I'm only going to cover A. If something has a special name, but that special name only makes understanding it more confusing, I'm going to leave it out. And this is the one that is really going to hurt some people, but while I'm going to make sure to mention as many playable characters as I can, if that character is not important to the overall plot, and I hate telling you guys this, but there are a lot of characters that are not important to the overall plot, then I'm not going to cover them that much. And let me just say, every single character in this series has their own plotline. They have their own backstory. They have their own goals. They have their own mission. It's one of the things that makes these characters so good. But if I tried to cover all of them in this video, it would just become even more of a mess than it already is. So we're just going to stick to the plot points that matter to the overall story. Also, as I said, this game loves to explain backstories long after you need to know them. I will not be doing that. I will be explaining the events of this story in the order that I feel makes them the most comprehensive. But okay, I know that was a lot, and I apologize for the delay, but... Well, let's just say I know if I didn't explain all of that, then there would be a ton of people saying you forgot to mention this in the comments. Guys, trust me, there is totally a chance that I'm going to end up forgetting to mention something that is very important. But odds are, if I don't bring something up in today's video, it's not because I forgot it, it's because I'm choosing to leave it out to keep this story simplified and accessible. After all, the point of this video today is not to be the Blaze Blue wiki book on tapes, it's to try and summarize the story in a way that everyone can understand. Plus, these are good games, and I would like people to check them out, so I want to summarize this in a way that will make it seem interesting to people, but will still leave you with some stuff to find on your own when you go and play them. But that's it, I think I've laid out everything that I need to set up before we begin, so now we can finally start the story of Blaze Blue. Our tale begins in a world between realities, a dimension known as the Boundary. The Boundary is a space that connects all realities together, because yes, there are alternate realities in these games, and that will come up much later on. The Boundary is filled with a substance known as Seether. Seether is essentially magical radiation. It's a substance that exists all around us, and in small doses it's completely harmless but thick doses of Seether can be incredibly toxic and harmful to normal humans. And at the very center of the boundary is the most concentrated form of Seether known as the Azure. And Seether does have magical properties that could grant someone magical powers, but Azure is in a whole other league. Azure is essentially the power to control reality itself. It gives you godlike powers to reshape all of creation. And the Azure is controlled by a giant machine called the Amaterasu Unit, also known as the Master Unit. And the Master Unit is essentially Robot God. It's the being that uses the Azure's reality shaping powers to control the course of the universe. But the Master Unit has two guards. A shield that can block absolutely anything called the Sukuyomi Unit, and the Susanoo Unit, a suit of armor that can destroy anything. And not just destroy, it erases its targets from existence without creating paradoxes. Yeah, it is the ultimate erase button. If something goes wrong with the Master Unit's creation, 
Susan O can wipe the problem out without having to worry about wrecking the rest of reality. So, the Master Yun is firmly guarded at the center of all realities by the ultimate sword and the ultimate shield, total defense and offense. But something went wrong. Due to the magical properties of Seether, slowly Susanoo grew a soul. It gained a mind of its own. And Susanoo looked around and said, You know, I kinda got a raw deal here. I'm just forced to be the Master Yu's slave for all of eternity? I just have to stand here in the infinite nothingness waiting for Robot God to tell me what to destroy? I didn't ask for this. I was made to destroy things, and I feel like the Master Yun is holding me back. So you know what? I'm out of here. I quit. And so the Susanoo Yun attempted to escape the boundary, and in the process of this, the soul inside the armor split apart from it, becoming its own separate creature, known as Yuki Terami. After Terami escaped, a whole bunch of stuff happened that I will get to way later in this video, but eventually, two scientists by the name of Aurelius Clover and Shuichiro Ayatsuki discovered a cauldron, which is essentially a gateway into the boundary. Terami found these scientists and formed an alliance with them, promising to give them information on the boundary. Why does Terami do this? Because he wants the two of them to build something for him. A prime field device. A prime field device is a humanoid-like robot that is capable of exploring the boundary, and Terami needs them to create him a very specific type of prime field device known as a Kusanagi, a sword that can kill a god. Yeah, even after freeing himself from the Master Unit, Terami just can't let things go. He won't be happy until he's killed Robot God. Also, Terami might just have been a spirit, but he was able to solidify his spirit into a body that he could walk around in. But he knew that, you know what, maybe, just maybe, something could end up happening to this spirit body of his. So he wanted a backup, a fake body that he could then slide his soul into in case something happened to him. So he asked Relius to make such a body for him. Relius complied and created an artificial body, but that body had a mind of its own. Why would he create a backup body for someone and then give that backup body its own mind? Because it would create drama and tension in the story later on. Okay, there actually is a reason why, but real talk, it's just so they can create drama in the story later on. This artificial body was known as Kazuma Kval, and he awakened in the magical city of Ishana. Oh yeah, magic is a thing in this universe, and there's whole magical societies for sorcerers to live and study in. Kazuma finds himself in the Ishana Magical Academy, where Relius is a teacher, and he has no knowledge of his origin or his actual purpose. He believes himself to be just another regular student, and he thinks he just has amnesia. Now, Kazuma is a kind kid, and he ends up making friends with some of the other students, including Trinity Glassfield, a very soft-spoken and gentle bookworm who has borderline romantic feelings for Cosma, and Kanoe Mercury, a far more aggressive and hardened scholar. Now, Kanoe Mercury was her real name, but later on she would join the Ten Sages, the leading sorcerers of Ishana, and after that she would only be referred to by her rank, Nine. Now, we'll get back to Cosma and his schoolyard chums in a bit, but for now, let's return to Terami and the two scientists he was stringing along. It was now December 31st, 2099, and Relius and Chuichiro had finished their prime field device and sent it into the cauldron to explore the boundary. Unfortunately, the prime field device didn't work, and something else would emerge from the cauldron. A titanic monster made up of swirling darkness, fangs, claws, and overflowing with seether crawled out of the cauldron and started on a path of destruction. This was the Black Beast, and it would be a recurring threat throughout the entire series, so make sure to remember it now. It ripped Terami's spirit body apart, trapped Shuichiro underground, and Relius was sucked into the cauldron, falling into the boundary. The Black Beast would begin tearing across Japan, wiping out anyone and everything in its path. The rest of the world saw what a threat this was, and fearing what would happen if the creature continued beyond Japan, unleashed a wave of nuclear strikes on the creature. The blast destroyed Japan, but left the Black Beast untouched. This is because the Black Beast is a creature that exists outside of reason. What does that mean? Well, think of reason as anything real, anything defined by the laws of nature. So, if you exist outside of reason, then the only things that can really affect you are things that exist outside of the natural world. In other words, magic. Speaking of magic, let's go ahead and check back in on that magical school in Cosma. 
Yes, Teremi's body had been destroyed, leaving him a wandering spirit barely able to hold onto this world, so that meant he needed that spare body that Relius had prepared for him. But Cosmo, because he had a mind of his own, wasn't really in a position for Teremi to take him over. So, Teremi began appearing to Cosmo, almost like a ghost haunting him, whispering in his ear, tempting him, tormenting him. Over time, he drove Cosmo mad and forced him to betray his friends, and now that his mind had been broken, Teremi was able to merge with Cosmo, making this his new body. However, Teremi didn't have much time to take his new body for a test drive, as a werewolf named Valkenhayn captures him and brings him back to his master, a vampire aristocrat named Clavis Alucard. Clavis was working behind the scenes to try and do something about the Black Beast, and he believed that Shuichiro might have the key to defeating it. And so, Clavis hires Jubei, a powerful fighter who is a member of a clan of Cat Beastkin. Oh yeah, there's also animal people in this world. So, for those of you keeping track at home, this world has magic, vampires, werewolves, and animal-human hybrids. And also nuclear weapons, so half high fantasy, half real world, I guess. Jubei's clan of Beastkin were all wiped out by the Black Beast, and now Jubei was all that was left. Jubei ends up running into Trinity, Nine, and Nine Sister Celica, and they're able to locate the lab that Shuichiro had been working in after being trapped underground. Shuichiro by this point had passed away, but before he died, he completed the ultimate weapon to destroy the Black Beast, Kushinata's Lynchpin, a giant device that could neutralize Seether, which is what the Black Beast's body was made of. Here's the problem, though. In order to use Kushinata's Lynchpin, a power source would be needed. That power source? Celica Mercury, Nine Sister, and Shuichiro's own daughter. Yes, Shuichiro was Nine and Selika's father, and he was... Let's just say... not the best. Then again, as we will see later on, the bad father rating system in Blaze Blue is kind of a sliding scale. Now, why did they need Selika? It's because Selika was born with something called the Power of Order, and this was essentially a universal constant. It was the antibodies of reality. It's neither good nor bad, it's something the universe imbues into a person in order to counter something that would threaten it. And in this case, that threat was Seether. So Selica had been born with the power to neutralize Seether. Just being near her made any traces of Seether vanish. Unfortunately, there were limits to her power, so there was no way that she could wipe out the Black Beast by herself. But if she sacrificed herself and put her soul into the linchpin, then it would wipe out all Seether across the world, including the Black Beast. However, Nine wasn't willing to let her sister sacrifice herself, and neither was someone else. Celica had been traveling with another character, a mysterious warrior called Blood Edge. Celica had found him injured and helped heal him back, and now upon hearing that Celica was going to sacrifice herself, Blood Edge stepped in and stopped her. He said that he would face the Black Beast by himself, and he would buy everyone one year. During that year, they would have to work to find some kind of a way to stop the Black Beast that didn't sacrifice Celica. Nine promised to uphold this deal, and Blood Edge left his red coat and sword with Celica before walking into the Black Beast, dying but in the process causing the Beast to go to sleep for a whole year. Why did this cause the Beast to go to sleep? We'll get back to that later. So, Nine now had one year to figure out how to beat the Black Beast. And upon realizing that only magic could defeat it, but there weren't nearly enough sorcerers around to fight it, she developed a way for normal humans to weaponize magic. She created devices called grimoires, and these machines were capable of funneling Seether into them to create an artificial form of magic called Ars Magus. I'm going to repeat that, because this is one of the biggest parts of Blaze Blue, and it's pretty much what this entire world would run on from this point forward. Seether is absorbed into Grimoires to create Ars Magus, an artificial form of magic. And just like regular magic, the variety of spells and abilities that can be created by Ars Magus are immense, and Ars Magus, made specifically for combat, is referred to as Ars Armagus. But in order to keep this simplified, I'm just going to refer to all Ars Magus as simply Ars Magus. But the most powerful form of Ars Magus took on the shape of 11 weapons known as the Nox Nictoris. Now, near as I can tell, the Nox Nictoris don't need grimoires to function, they sort of just exist as solidified Ars Magus in the shape of weapons. So, you might be wondering how they can do this? 
Well, it's because unlike other Ars Magus, which are created by Grimars, the Nox Nectoris are created by souls. Lots and lots of souls. So yeah, big power, bigger cost. So, humans now had a way to fight against the Black Beast in Ars Magus, but they still needed someone to lead them. And so a team came together. Nine Trinity and Jubei were joined by Valkenhayn, but they still needed more power. And Nine knew where they could get it. Terami might have destroyed their friend Kazuma, but he was incredibly strong, and Nine knew they would need that strength. So, Nine cast a spell on Terami to control his mind, keeping him from rebelling and forcing him to work alongside them. So that made five mighty warriors, but they still weren't enough. Even with the armies of man wielding Ars Magus and these five fighters leading the charge, the Black Beast was just too strong. That's when the final warrior appeared, a mysterious armored man named Hakumen. He joined these other warriors and they became known as the Six Heroes, and after a long battle known as the Dark War, the Black Beast was finally destroyed. However, that didn't mean that humanity had been saved. Remember how I said that the Black Beast was full of Seether, and that Seether in large doses is poisonous to humans? Yeah, well when the Black Beast died, it released all that Seether across the planet, making almost the entire Earth uninhabitable. And so, humans fled to mountaintops where the Seether couldn't reach, and they built hierarchical cities, which are essentially cities that are stacked on top of each other. But the rise in Seether wasn't the only problem left over from the war. There was still the matter of Yuki Terami. Yes, he had been under nine spell during the war, but eventually he managed to break free, and he wanted revenge. He killed Trinity Glassfield and threw Nine into a cauldron. In order to stop him, Hakuman sacrificed himself by grabbing Terami and jumping into the boundary with him. So, out of the six heroes, the only two left were Valkenhayn, who had gone back to working for the Alucard family, and Jubei, who had to give the bad news to Selica, who had gone on to become a nun and open up her own church. Now, after everything that had happened, after the war, after the Black Beast, after the Seether, after having to move to the top of mountains in brand new societies, as you can imagine, the world had changed greatly. Governments all across the planet had pretty much collapsed, so a brand new ruling power rose up. A military force calling itself the Novus Orbis Librarium, otherwise known as the NOL. It was formed in order to manage all the Grimars that had been created during the Dark War, claiming they would decide who got to use them, and as you can imagine, they only thought that those loyal to the NOL should be allowed to use them. Most people didn't agree with this, and many started to rebel against the NOL, mocking them and how they held onto all these grimoires by calling them the Library. The NOL set up bases in every major city and created cauldrons in their bases in order to absorb Seether from the Boundary to help power their grimoires and other tools. Also because they're still trying to find the Azure Hen at the center of the boundary in order to gain ultimate power, but we'll delve into that later. For now, let's move away from the NOL and spotlight some other important events that were happening during this time. First up, you remember Relius? You remember how he fell into the cauldron and got lost in the boundary? Well, the boundary isn't just a void of magical radiation, it's also a gateway to other places and other times. Relius eventually re-emerged 80 years after he fell in, but after falling into the boundary, he kinda went crazy. I mean, crazier than he already was. He had always been a bit unhinged, but upon falling into the boundary, he ended up seeing the whole of creation. He got a taste of ultimate knowledge, and upon emerging and returning to the real world, he now looked at humans as nothing more than meat bags with souls in them, and he only had one goal, to gain more knowledge, and he would use whatever tools he had at his disposal, including other people, to make that happen. A few years later, Jubei, now wandering the world trying to destroy the NOL's cauldrons, again, we'll explain why that is later, ended up discovering a lab, and inside of it there were three young siblings, Ragna, Jin, and their sister Saya. He rescued these kids and took them back to Selica's church where she would raise them. And in case you're wondering how Jubei and Selica are still alive after all this time, it's because Jubei is a beastkin and beastkin age slowly, and Selica has healing magic that's keeping her young. Now, as I said, the NOL was scooping up power across the entire planet, but there were those who opposed them. First up was Sector 7. 
Sector 7 wasn't really a team or a single force, more of just a group of super scientists who all came together to share resources and data to try and fight back against the NOL. And yes, you heard right, Sector 7 was made up of scientists, 100% pure science. No Ars Magus science mixed with magic here, just good old fashioned equations and test tubes. And one of the leading scientists for Sector 7 was Kokonoi Mercury. And if that last name sounds familiar, it's because she was the daughter of Nine and Jubei. Yes, Nine hooked up with a cat, we've all made the jokes already, let's move on. Now, Kokonoi kind of despised both of her parents. In fact, because she despised Nine so much, she refused to use magic in any way, and that's why she decided to dedicate herself to science so much. And as a result, she ended up creating several breakthroughs in her time. Many of which aren't entirely morally on the up and up. And Kokonoi has a few people working under her. The most notable of them being Tager. Tager was a mercenary whose entire squad was wiped out while trying to capture a dangerous criminal named Azrael. But Kokonoi was able to revive him by implanting Oni DNA inside of him. Because apparently Onis are also a thing in this universe. This brought Tager back from the brink of death, but now he had a reddish skin tone, was as big as the house, and had no memories of his past. But he does know that he trusts Kokonoi and her plans. Even if sometimes she can be the worst boss in the world to him. The two other scientists working under Kokonoi worth knowing were Lychee Failing and Lot Carmine, known to his friends as Roy. Now, Roy was fiercely loyal to Kokonoi, and Lychee was starting to fall in love with Roy, so everyone was getting along just fine. Up until Roy started to become obsessed with the Boundary and the giant cauldron that Sector 7 was keeping in their basement. He started working day and night writing down his theories on the Boundary, with every passing day becoming more and more unhinged. Kokonoi and Lychee tried to help him, but he was too far gone. And one night he snuck into the Sector 7 cauldron, peered inside, and came face to face with Yuki Terumi. Yes, Terumi just happened to escape at the exact time that Roy was looking inside the cauldron. How did Terumi get out of the boundary? We'll explain that later. Terumi decided to do what he does best, be a total dick, and told the already unstable Roy that everything he wanted was right inside the cauldron. So Roy jumped inside of it and... Well, remember how Relius went mad from being inside the cauldron? Yeah, he was the lucky one. Because the overflowing seether inside the boundary mutated Roy into a monster that would become known as Arachne, who fled Sector 7 and head toward the hierarchical city of Kagatsuchi looking for more seether. So Yuki Terumi and Relius Clover were both back and alive in the modern day. Well, mostly. Terumi was still just a spirit that was absorbing the negative emotions of the world in order to give him enough strength to stick around. He needed a new body, so Relius got to work on one, while Terumi started his own plan. Remember, Terumi still wanted to kill the Master Yun, and he needed something powerful to accomplish that. And that something would require a plan with about a thousand overly complicated steps to it. For starters, Terumi made his way to the church where Ragna, Jin, and Saya were being raised. Now in his ghostly state, Terumi couldn't do much, but he was able to tempt Saya, whispering in her ear a bit until she agreed to come with him. Terumi then handed Jin a sword, but not just any sword, Yuki Anasa, the legendary Nox Nectoris Ice Sword. And remember how I said that Nox Nectoris are all made by souls being merged together? Well, the soul in control of Yuki Anasa overpowered Jin's tiny child mind and commanded him to kill Ragna. Jin cut off Ragna's arm, killed Celica, and left Ragna to bleed out in the church as it burned down around him. Ragna was saved, however, by Jubei, who returned just in the nick of time. Jubei replaced Ragna's arm with the Azure Grimoire, one of the oldest and most powerful grimoires, with the power to tap into the Azure itself. By the way, in case anyone is still confused about this, yes, they are called grimoires, and grimoires are typically a type of book, but that's just a name. Grimoires in Blaze Blue can be shaped like anything. And the Azure Grimoire is kind of an amorphous, constantly shifting blob, so Ragna is able to take the Azure Grimoire and reshape it into a fully functioning hand. So in one day, Ragna ended up losing his arm, his family, and his home, but at least he gained an incredibly powerful Grimoire. That's gotta be good for something, right? Problem is, the Azure Grimoire comes with a major drawback. It absorbs the souls of anyone around him. So yes, Ragna was able to replace his arm with this legendary Grimoire, but if he stays around anyone for too long, it'll drain their life force. Over the next several years, Ragnar was trained to fight by Jubei, who was strong enough to resist the soul-eating effect of the Grimoire, and he would also receive continuous vague life lessons from another character who kept popping up from time to time, 
Rachel Alucard. Yeah, remember that royal vampire that I mentioned earlier, Clavis Alucard? Well, this is his daughter, and she would continuously show up to give Ragna ominous messages to try and steer him down a path. Why is she always so vague? Well, part of it is because she's a snob who views everyone as being beneath her, but it's also because Rachel just flat out can help Ragna directly. Yes, you see, in addition to being a vampire, Rachel is also known as a bystander. At least that's what it's called in Japanese. Yeah, let me go ahead and make something clear. Most of the terms in Blaze Blue are different in Japanese and in English. And for all of these, I'm going to be using the English version of the names because, well, this video is in English, so it's probably what most people watching it can understand. But in English, she is referred to as an observer, which is a fine name. Problem is, there is another thing in Blaze Blue called an observer, and they didn't change the name in English, so in English, there are now two different things called observers because the lore of Blaze Blue wasn't complicated enough already. Well, okay. In all fairness, they do end up correcting this in later games, and they do rename it to Onlooker, which is a fitting name. But because it has already now had two different names, and Onlooker still sounds a whole lot like Observer to me, I feel like if I called it Onlooker, it would just confuse some people. Those people would be me. So yeah, I'm just going to keep calling it Bystander, but that's the only thing I'm going to refer to by the Japanese name in this video. So what is a Bystander? Well, like the power of order, it is another natural constant, a law of the universe. There must always be someone who is a bystander. And whoever is chosen to be a bystander is given incredible powers. But they aren't allowed to use them. Yeah, you know the Watcher in Marvel Comics? Bystanders are just that. They have long lives, incredible powers, and can witness everything happening in the world all at once. Just so long as they promise not to interfere with the world. Yeah, they're essentially meant to be a living history book of the universe, constantly recording and cataloging everything that's going on. So Rachel could tell that Ragnar was going to be important, but she couldn't do anything to directly push him towards his destiny. She had to just sit back and occasionally give him some hints, all disguised behind insults. Meanwhile, Jin was adopted by the Kisaragi family, one of the 12 richest most elite families in the world, who form a group known as the Duodecim. Jin went to the NOL Academy, where he excelled in his studies. Joining him at this academy were numerous other students who would go on to be very important later on, including Tsubaki Yayoi, another child of the Duodesim families who grew up being close friends with Jin, Makoto Nanaya, an upbeat squirrel-type beastkin, Carl, who would end up leaving the school shortly after joining it, but I'll get back to him later, and Noel Vermillion. Noelle is a sheepish girl who was also adopted by a duodecim family, and she's got a natural affinity for using Ars Magus, so much so that early in her studies she was able to summon out Bolveric, one of the legendary Noxnic Taurus shaped like a pair of guns. Also, Noelle just happens to look a lot like Jin and Ragnar's sister Saya, and hey, fun drinking game, take a shot every time that you hear, looks a lot like Jin and Ragnar's sister Saya. I'm just kidding, please don't do that, I don't want you to hurt yourself. So Jin's studies were going well, he was rising in the ranks, everything was set out for him. That is, unless... War were declared. What's that? War were declared. Yeah, remember I said there were people out there who opposed the NOL hoarding all this power? And in case you couldn't tell from that list of NOL Academy members, they tended to hoard them specifically for the rich and powerful. So this led to a civil war in the land of Ikarga as the people rose up against the NOL. Now, Ikaria is referred to as a hierarchical city, but it's more of multiple hierarchical cities all working together. The battle raged on between Karga and the NOL, with much of the land of Ikarga being destroyed and turned to rubble, and it all came to an end when Jin Kisaragi killed the Ikarga leader, Tinjo, at which point many people from Ikarga were forced to leave their home and move to a small village inside the hierarchical city of Kagatsuchi. Hey, that's the second time we mentioned Kagatsuchi. I wonder if it's going to be important in a moment. Now, Jin Kizaragi was hailed as the hero of the Akarga War. Not that he really cared. I haven't talked about character personalities much in this video because I mostly did that in part one, but yeah, Jin is kind of a sociopath. He views anyone around him as being nothing more than trash, and you get the feeling that he killed Tenjo not because it was his mission, but just because he could. But nonetheless, Jin still got a major promotion for ending the civil war that was started by Ikarga. Except that it wasn't. Yeah, this isn't revealed until way later, but something I want you to keep in your mind right now. 
The Akarga Civil War was just a cover for a battle that was happening between the NOL and Sector 7. Now, why did Sector 7 and the NOL start a war with each other and said in a country that wanted nothing to do with either of them? Well, because both sides needed a whole lot of people to die. Why did they need that? We'll come back to that later. Sorry, I know that's a huge tease, but trust me, it would make zero sense if I explained it right now. I just want you to have some context for the Ikarga War, and to be aware that Sector 7 and the NOL are both super messed up. Meanwhile, as all this was happening, Ragna had spent several years training under Jubei, and now it was time for him to graduate. Jubei went to the burned down church and found something in there that Selica had been holding onto, the sword and jacket that belonged to Blood Edge, and he decided to give them to Ragna, who adopted the name of the man who used to wield them, now calling himself Ragna the Blood Edge. Jubei then explained to him why he had been destroying NOL cauldrons across the world, and Ragna understood he had to take up this cause as well. And so Ragna set out, destroying cauldrons, attacking NOL bases, and racking up a massive body count. As a result, Ragna gained the nickname Grim Reaper, and even had the highest bounty in history, 90 billion platinum dollars placed on his head. But this didn't slow Ragna down as he kept targeting cauldrons, and he now found himself moving towards his next target, located in the hierarchical city of Kagetsuchi. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the backstory to Blaze Blue. Yes, we are now finally at the first game. I told you there was a ton of backstory, and again, that was with me leaving stuff out to keep it comprehensive. But don't worry, from here on out, it's much smoother. At least I hope it is. I haven't actually written the rest of the script just yet. For all I know, everything is about to turn into an incomprehensive gibberish. Let's find out together, shall we, as we head to the events of Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger. Ragna heads into Kagatsuchi and makes his way towards the cauldron. He runs into Arachne, who is now a slimy monster obsessed with finding the Azure, so Ragna's mere presence draws him in. Ragna defeats him, but before he can kill the beast, Lychee appears and begs him to stop. She's been living in Kagatsuchi for several years now, working as a doctor at a small local clinic, trying to track Arachne down and find a way to return him to normal. Meanwhile, back at NOL headquarters, Noel, now working as Jin's assistant, brings him a report that says Ragna the Blood Edge is reported to be heading towards Kagatsuchi. As soon as Jin hears this name, something in him snaps. He starts cackling like a madman and abandons his post to head to Kagatsuchi in the hopes of finding his brother and killing him once and for all. But upon arriving in Kagatsuchi, all he finds is a ninja by the name of Bang Shishigami. Bang was one of the top disciples of Tinjo, the leader of Akarga, and he even witnessed Jin killing his master right in front of his eyes. Bang wants nothing more than to make Jin pay, but his master told him to reject hate and embrace love and justice and to practice forgiveness. And Bang has carried that message with him to Kagatsuchi, where he watches over and protects the refugees from Ikaruga. He's also kind of a goof and is constantly embarrassing himself, but the people still love him for keeping their spirits high and protecting them however he can. So Bang decides to let Jin go, who continues on his way towards the cauldron, knowing that Ragna will be heading there as well. The last character to head towards Kagatsuchi is Noelle herself. She's been tasked by the NOL with bringing Jin back, and she's being accompanied by Hazma, the captain of the NOL's intelligence department. And yes, he's exactly who you think he is, but let's put a pin in that for now. As soon as she arrives in Kagatsuchi, Noelle is immediately attacked by Carl. You remember Carl? The kid who went to the NOL Academy? Well, he left the school and ended up becoming a vigilante, essentially a bounty hunter who chases down people for the NOL. And Carl... Well, life has not been good to Carl. He's walking around with a giant mechanical doll, Nirvana, which is another one of the Nox Nectoruses. Nox Nectori? Not important. What is important, though, is that he doesn't call this puppet Nirvana. He calls it Sister. Why is that? Well, that's because it is his sister. Yeah, Carl's full name is Carl Clover. And he is the son of Aurelius Clover, and his father put his sister Ada's soul into Nirvana. Carl became a vigilante specifically to hunt down Ragna, because Ragna is in possession of the Azure Grimoire, and since the Azure has the power to reshape reality, Carl hopes he can use it to return his sister to normal. He questions Noelle about Ragna's whereabouts, and when she doesn't answer, he gets violent. Noelle is able to defeat him thanks to her own Nox Nictoris, and Noelle and Hazma head towards the cauldron as well. 
Also worth pointing out that after this battle, Carl is healed up by Lychee, who reminds him of his sister Ada, and he also meets Bang, who provides Carl with some positive reinforcement and support, something Carl has probably never experienced in his life. At the NOL base above the cauldron, Ragna and Jin meet, and Jin is overpowered with bloodlust. They battle, and Ragna comes out on top, knocking Jin out. Even though Ragna knows they have unfinished business, the cauldron has to be dealt with first. However, as he makes his way deeper and deeper down to the building, he senses an incredible power. Someone is watching and waiting for him. And Ragnar comes face to face with Hakumen. Yes, Hakumen was pulled out of the boundary by Kokonoe, who needed his power for a mission, but Hakumen had other plans. He wanted to head towards the cauldron because he had one goal pushing him forward. Kill Ragnar the Blood Edge. Now, why would Hakumen want to kill Ragnar? Ragnar wasn't even born until about 80 years after he fell into the boundary. He wouldn't even know who this guy was. Well, I'll get back to that later. Sorry, I know that's a whole lot of I'll get back to it later, but I promise I will return to them. Hakumen is too much for Ragnar, and he's about to defeat him, but Ragnar then taps into the Azure Grimoire and becomes strong enough to match Hakumen. But before the fight can end, Kokonoi locates Hakumen and teleports him back to Sector 7. With that, Ragnar finally arrives at the cauldron, but he finds he's too late. He was trying to make it there in time to stop the cauldron from creating a Morokumo unit. Okay, remember what a prime field device was? A robot designed to explore the boundary? Well, a Morokumo unit is a prime field device that is designed to not just explore the boundary, but also for combat. Ragnar had already destroyed a few other ones at the previous cauldrons, but now he came face to face with their newest model, New 13. New 13 is obsessed with Ragna in a very creepy way. She acts like she loves him, but also acts like she wants the two of them to die together? Yeah, it's a little bit messed up. Oh, and to make it extra disturbing for Ragna, she just happens to look a lot like his sister, Saya. The two of them fight, and Ragna is left bleeding out, sliced up, and close to death. New impales Ragna, and suddenly the two of them start to merge together as they both fall into the cauldron, with an injured Jin jumping in right behind them. So... Yeah, the hero of the game died! Guess this story summary was quicker than I thought. Okay, you all see the time code, you know this isn't over. So, what happened to Ragna? Well, remember how I said the boundary can connect different locations and different times? Well, Ragna, Nu, and Jin all get sent back 100 years to December 31st, 2099. And if you're thinking that date sounds familiar, it's because that's the date the Black Beast emerged from the cauldron. That's because Ragna is the Black Beast. Yes, the Black Beast is essentially the evolved form of the Azure Grimoire. Once it consumes enough souls, it will turn its wielder into a Black Beast. Although, there is another way to make this happen. Have the Azure Grimoire merge with a Morokumo unit, which is why New 13 had this uncontrollable urge to join with Ragna, like it was her calling. So, Ragna got sent back in time and became the Black Beast, but what happened in the present? Oh, not much. Just the end of the world. Yeah, bear with me, folks, because it's about to get way crazier. In space, there was a satellite that housed another Noxnik Taurus called Takimikazuchi, and this was a giant monster with unbelievable power, and the moment it woke up, it fired a blast down the Earth, wiping Kagatsuchi from the map. Why did it do that? I'll get back to that later. Well, the rest of the world is okay, right? Not quite! You see, the master unit, for reasons that... I'm sorry, but again, I'll get back to later. Like, way, way later. The Master Unit did not want any of this to happen, so when Takimikazuchi destroys Kagatsuchi, the Master Unit just resets the timeline back to January 1st, 2100, the day right after the Black Beast appeared. And so begins the Great Blaze Blue time loop. Yes, that's right, these 100 years kept repeating themselves over and over again, each time with small changes, but the end result always being the same. Ragnar always becomes the Black Beast, Takimikazuchi always destroys Kagatsuchi, the timeline always gets reset. Because of this, it makes the story mode in the arcade mode of this game very unique, because every character has their own story mode with multiple endings, and all of them are technically canon, 
as each of them depict different runs through the time loop. Now before we go on, guess what? I'm finally going to start explaining some of those questions I left dangling. Now that we know that Ragnar is the Black Beast, a few puzzle pieces start to get filled in. Why did Jin cut off Ragnar's arm when they were kids, and why does he still want to kill him so badly? Because of his sword. Yes, I mentioned that the Yuhyanasa was a Nox Nectoris, meaning it was a weapon with souls inside of it, and a weapon made specifically to kill the Black Beast. So when the young Jin was given this sword, the souls inside of it overtook him and said, Hey, is that that guy who's going to become the Black Beast? Time to do the exact thing I was made to do! Same thing goes for Hakuman. He fought in the Dark War against the Black Beast, and he knew that Ragna was the Black Beast, so the moment he arrived in the present, he set out to kill Ragna before he transformed. But how does Hakuman know that Ragna is the Black Beast? Well, I'll explain that... right now, actually. So, I mentioned that Rachel Alucard was a bystander, someone who had to keep observing the world endlessly without interference. Well, this also means that she existed outside of our time, so she didn't get reset with every single time loop, meaning she had to keep witnessing the same 100 years repeating themselves over and over again. But on the 299th reset, Jin jumped into the cauldron and traveled back in time as well, and Rachel found him and said, Oh hey, this is different. Hey Jin, you want to kill Ragna, right? Well, going through the boundary kind of wrecked your entire body and you can't fight anymore. But my father just happens to be collecting artifacts that could possibly stop the Black Beast, including this insanely powerful Susanoo armor that just needs a soul inside of it to work. So, what do you say? Yes, Hakuman is really Jin after going through the boundary and having his soul put into the Susanoo unit. And because he knows what will happen to his brother, that's why he's so dead set on killing him. But in Hakuman's story when he confronts Jin, you actually see him feeling far more remorseful about than Jin did when he faced Ragna, so... I guess 100 years in the boundary really chilled him out. So, to recap, Ragna's Azure Grimoire causes him to merge with the Morokumo unit New 13. They become the Black Bees and get sent back in time. Then the satellite monster Takimikazuchi destroys the city of Kagatsuchi, and the Master Unit resets the universe back to right after the Black Beast appeared 100 years ago. Eventually, over the course of all these loops with minor changes happening, Jin ends up going back in time as well and joins with the Susanoo Unit to become Hakuman, which also locks Hakuman into the time loop, making him a constant that appears in every single loop as well. And I'm really wishing at this point that I didn't use this clip from The Good Place during our King of Fires retrospective because it fits so much better right now. My brain is melting. How can events happen before the ones that happened before? But that raises the question. What caused this time loop to finally break? That would be Noel. Yes, after hundreds and hundreds of resets, eventually the stars aligned just right and Noel found her way to the cauldron before Ragna. She came face to face with New 13 and Noel lost all control of her body speaking mechanically and engaging New 13 in combat, but the Morokumo unit overpowered her and she was about to kill Noelle when Ragna jumped in and saved her. Noelle had never seen Ragna in person before, but something about him felt familiar. Ragna fought New again, lost, and fell into the boundary with New all over again, but this time Noelle ran in and grabbed Ragna, pulling him back up and saving him. Rachel then appears and says, Oh, thank God it finally happened. About freaking time. Ragna finally didn't turn to the Black Beast and the time loop is finally done. Well, almost. There was still the little matter of the giant satellite monster that wanted to destroy Kagetsuchi, which would cause the Master Unit to rewind time again. But Rachel had waited for a millennia to see Ragna not turn to the Black Beast so she wasn't going to let it all get reset again. So, she called upon the Sukoyomi unit. Yeah, remember that giant impenetrable shield that guards the Master Unit? Well, I guess as a bystander, Rachel just has access to that thing in a break glass in case the universe is about to be destroyed case. So Rachel summons out the Sukoyomi unit to guard Kagetsuchi from the space blast, saving the city, and finally ending the time loop. So, that was it. They finally managed to break the loop. Ragnar was saved, New 13 was defeated and cast into the boundary. Everything was taken care of. Except for... There he is. 
Yep, Hazma had been there watching and waiting the entire time. And guess what? You're never going to believe it. Prepare to be shocked. Hazma is actually Yuki Terami. Yes, Hazma was the new artificial body that Relius Clover made for Terami, and he had wormed his way into the inner well to not just manipulate events behind the scenes, which again, I'll get back to later, but also because he knew that it could get him into this exact spot. You see, Terami also existed outside of reason just like Rachel. So whenever the time loop began, he got sent back to his old body, being forced to relive everything over and over again. But he was manipulating events ever slightly to try and get everything to line up just right. Now, okay, what I'm about to explain to you is the most complicated thing about Blaze Blue. And considering that I just explained a time loop, that's saying something! You remember how I said in Japanese Rachel was referred to as a bystander, but in English they translated that to an observer? But I wasn't going to call her that because there was another thing in the game called observer that was way more important. Yeah, here we go. It's time to talk about observing. Observing is an ability in the Blaze Blue universe where, to put it as simply as possible, you can essentially pull into reality something that doesn't exist. Yeah, buckle up folks, it's about to get weird. People with the power to observe, in other words, observers, can see different possibilities, and they can then observe that possibility and bring it into reality. The process of doing this is called a phenomena intervention, and it can be something as simple as seeing someone down the street and saying, they should be standing right next to me instead. And then you observe the possibility where they're next to you, and then they just teleport down the street. Remember when Hakuman was fighting Ragna and suddenly he teleported back to Sector 7? That's because Kokonoi observed him being back, but it can also be something as big and grand as creating something totally new out of nothing or manipulating an entire location and everyone within it. Essentially, it's god powers, which makes sense as it's basically what the Master Unit does to control the universe. And you want to know the craziest part of this? This is actually based on real theoretical science. Yes, I do realize I just said real theoretical, but I didn't know a better way of putting it. About a decade ago, I watched a documentary on the Many Worlds theory that was about how scientists use quantum mechanics to explain multiple realities, and as I was playing through these games, it suddenly clicked with me. Oh wait! This is the exact thing they're talking about! It's way too complicated for someone like me to explain, but essentially it involves sending out electrons to various locations, meaning they did exist at different spots all at once but they would only appear wherever the scientists observed them. The similar way of explaining this is Schrodinger's cat, which is an old thought experiment that says that a cat is in a box with poison, and you don't know if that poison has killed the cat until you open the box up and look, meaning the cat is both alive and dead until you observe it. And I think Maury P, the creator of Blaze Blue, knew about these theories and based observing around it, because as I said, Schrodinger's cat is the most famous example of this, and who is one of the biggest observers in Blaze Blue? Koganoi. What is Koganoi? A cat. Could be a coincidence, but that's a hell of a coincidence. Now I know that observing sounds far too overpowered, but there are some drawbacks to it. For starters, as you can probably guess, what you can and cannot observe all depends on how strong your power as an observer is. So it's not like if you gain the power to observe, then you can just control time and space. No, if you have small observer powers, then you'll barely be able to do anything with it. Also, once you observe something into reality, then you have to keep observing it or else it will return to the way it was. Unless you're just a super high and mighty all-powerful observer, then you essentially have the reality stone and you can reshape the world however you want. So, what does this have to do with anything? Well, as you've noticed from Relius and Arachne, when people fall into the boundary, it can change them. So, when Noel leaned over the cauldron and looked in to grab Ragna, she stared directly into the boundary itself and this gave her the Eyes of the Azure, making her the successor of the Azure. What the heck does that mean? It means she was now an observer, and a very high level observer at that. But she couldn't control it just yet. And knowing this is what happened, that's when Hazma stepped out and said, Hey, Noelle, look at me. Bitch. Yes, Hazuma's entire plan all along was to get Noelle into this exact spot where she could gain the eyes of the Azure, 
then have her use her new observation powers on him, because Terami was still just a spirit struggling to hold on to this world, needing the body of Hazma to keep him alive and unable to access any of his powers. But the moment that Noelle looked at him, her new eyes saw the spirit of Terami inside of Hazma, and thereby she observed his true self, returning him back to his original powers. Hazma then fled, ready to start the next phase of his plan, and that is where the first game ends. Yes, this was all a story about breaking an endless time loop by having Noel gain the eyes of the Azure and resurrecting Terami's power. And I know that sounds like an insanely complicated series of events that all had to happen for Terami's plan to work, but you have to remember, this timeline looped hundreds upon hundreds of times. Yes, it's a crazy plan, which is why it took so many tries for it to actually work. Also, you might be looking at the title of this game wondering, Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger? What's a Calamity Trigger? Calamity Trigger was the event of Noelle gaining the eyes of the Azure. It's called a trigger because by breaking the time loop and by granting her the power to see all possibilities, it opened up a nearly infinite number of possible realities for the future to follow. And this sea of new possibilities that was formed was known as the Continuum Shift, which is the title of the next game. Also, in case anyone who's wondering what the heck a Blaze Blue is, it's just another name for the Azure Grimoire. Yeah, remember how I said everything in this game has like four or five different names? There you go. So, that brings us to the second game. But before we can begin that, there's one other big nutty thing in Blaze Blue's backstory that I haven't talked about yet, because it would have made zero sense to you if you didn't know what observing was. Long ago, before all the stuff with Relius and the Black Beast and the Six Heroes, back before any of that, mankind, aware of what the Master Unit was, attempted to create their own robot god. This was known as the Takamagahara system, which was presided over by three different AI units. The Takamagahara system also had the power to observe, and it used these powers to basically steer humankind, controlling their destinies. However, the Takamagahara's observing powers were nothing compared to the Master Unit, so if the Master Unit wanted to, it could overrule anything the Takamagahara system did. And the Takamagahara system didn't like that. So fake robot god decided it wanted to kill real robot god. So they freed Yuki Terami from the boundary because thanks to him having been one of the original deities from within the boundary, he was immune to phenomena interventions, meaning the master unit wouldn't be able to stop him. Takamagahara was also the one who kept commanding Takimikazuchi to fire on Kagetsuji because they knew it would cause the master unit to reset the universe which is what they wanted to happen again and again until they got the exact turnout they wanted. So okay, just to recap that. The Tagamagahara brought back Terami to help them destroy the Master Unit, and they kept destroying Kagetsuchi because they knew it would force the Master Unit to restart the time loop where they would then manipulate events to try and get different results. But when Noel saved Ragna, Rachel knew the Master Unit wanted to keep him alive, so Rachel caused the giant shield Tsukoyomi to protect the city. So Takamagahara still didn't like these events, but Terami, their little chaos agent down on Earth, was very happy with these events because it allowed him to use Noel to gain his powers back. Which lets us know that even though both Terami and Takamagahara want the Master Unit destroyed, they both still probably have their own plans. God, can you believe we're only on the second game? In fact, speaking of that, we're awfully far into this video right now, so I just wanted to say, if you're still watching, then thank you. That means a lot to me. A whole lot of work went into this video, as you can probably tell. And if you're still with me, then I can only assume that you're enjoying the video in some way, so maybe leave a like, leave a comment. That's the kind of stuff that lets YouTube know to promote these videos around, and I awfully would appreciate it. In fact, tell you what, everyone just go into the comments right now and just tell me, how confused are you at this point? Have I lost you? Do you still get it? Is this all just pure nonsense and you just enjoy having it on in the background with some weird ASMR? Go ahead and let me know all that in the comments down below. Also, going to take a quick second right now just to say, if you want to support this channel even further, then we do now have a Patreon where you can go to get early looks at videos, and you can find all that in the description down below. But, back to the video. Okay, let's actually start the next story. Picking up right after the events of the last game, Noelle is tagging along with Ragna, but Ragna tells her to get lost. The two of them go their own separate ways, only for Ragna to get attacked by Carl. He beats Carl, but Nirvana stabs Ragna, causing him to fall down to the bottom of the hierarchical city, where he lands in the Kaka village. 
The Kakar Clan are a group of cat-like beastkin who were all cloned from Jubei during the Dark War to fight against the Black Beast. But they didn't quite turn out as good as Jubei, so now they all just kind of chill out here in Kagatsuji. Ragna is saved by the protector of the Kakar Clan, Tao Kaka, who Ragna actually met and bought food for in the last game, but didn't really fit into my story summary, so I left it out. But as unlikely of a pair as they are, over the course of these games, Ragna and Tao would actually become friends, as Ragna enjoys Tao's company, and Tao thinks Ragna is a good guy who buys her food. Ragna leaves after he recovers, and he runs into a small child who... also... needs food. What a... hungry people in these games. Ragna buys the kid food, and learns there's something strange about them. This is Platinum the Trinity, and they are actually three souls in one. Their body contains the soul of Cinna, a soft-spoken young boy, and Luna, a foul-mouthed young girl. And the two of them carry around another Nox Nictoris, Mukarin. And within Mukarin is the third soul belonging to Tranny Glassfield of the six heroes. Yes, before being killed, Tranny sent her soul into her Nox Nictoris, which came into the possession of Luna and Cinna. Platinum was trained by Jubei to use the Nox Nictoris, and Jubei left them with the important task of heading to Kagatsuchi and finding Bang Shishigami. Speaking of Bang, he's been busy. He meets back up with Jin again after Ragnar defeated him and helps him recover, because even if he despises Jin, Bang will always help someone in need. He then finds Carl and again gets a nice bonding moment with him as he helps him recover as well. Then Platinum finds Bang, and Tranny Glassfield is able to temporarily take over Platinum's body and tells Bang that his true enemy isn't Jin, it's the NOL itself. Someone is working behind the scenes of the NOL, and they orchestrated the Akarga Civil War that led to his master's death. But his master's son is still alive, and they can bring about the revival of his clan, and they can lead this land to a bright future. But in order for that to happen, Bang must head back to Ikarga. Carl, on the other hand, isn't getting such good news. He follows Bang for a bit, but then splits off to hunt down his father, Relius. He runs into Lychee, who again reminds him of his sister, and shows that she does care about Carl, and Carl, for probably the first time in his entire life, gets a moment to actually cry over all the horrible crap that's happened to him. Damn, poor Carl. I mean, I can't like him too much because he's a puppet fighter, but I do feel bad for the kid. Carl then finds his father, who now has his own giant puppet. This is Relius' own version of a Nox Nictoris called Ignis. Fun fact, Ignis was also the name of Carl's mom and Relius' wife. Wow, that's a weird coincidence, huh? Yes, it's exactly what you think it is. Relius is just... the worst. Relius beats Carl and tells him that if he truly wants to save his sister, then he must become like him. He must come to Ikarga and learn how to truly see humans as nothing more than tools for his experiments. Only then will his mind expand enough to learn Relius' secrets. Jumping back to Jin, after he recovers from his injuries, he finds that he can no longer use his sword. For some reason, it's not responding to him. He even runs into Ragna and challenges him again, but Ragna now easily stomps him down. Through these various battles, Jin learns that he's lost his powers because the Nox Nictoris had been controlling him this entire time. But now Jin was starting to get stronger. He was starting to rebel against the sword Yukianasa. So now if he wanted his powers back, he had to become stronger than the sword and be the one to control it. This was going to be hard for Jin though, because remember how Noelle was sent to retrieve Jin in the last game? Well, since she didn't come back, now Jin is a wanted man, and the rest of the NOL has been ordered to kill him on sight. And who was leading this hunt for Jin? Why, his old childhood friend, Tsubaki. Yes, yeah, Tsubaki loved Jin, she respected him and wanted to be by his side. But she was also raised thinking that the NOL was always right, and she shouldn't question them. So when Hazuma returns to the NOL headquarters after the last game, and tells her that she has to hunt down and kill Jin and Noel, she was tortured by this but she knew she had no choice and she had to agree to it. Now, Tsubaki wasn't nearly as strong as Jin or Noel, but luckily for her, her family had in their possession an ancient weapon, an Ars Armagus known as Izayoi. Izayoi not only grants Tsubaki a huge boost to her power, but it also has the ability to steal light, which means that she can encase her opponents in darkness, but the downside is that it steals the light from Tsubaki herself, mean that by using the Izayoi, she's slowly making herself go blind. Also, the more that she uses it, the more... unbalanced she begins to act. However, that's not because of the Izayoi, that's because of something that I'll get to later. 
Tsubaki ends up fighting against Noel, but can't bring herself to defeat her old friend and lets her go. After that, she ends up running into Hakumen, and the two of them form something of a bond with each other, because in Hakumen's timeline, back when he was still Jin, he and Tsubaki were even closer. But Tsubaki ended up dying in that timeline, and he's always cursed himself for not being able to save her. However, their bonding moment is cut short when Hazuma arrives, and Hazuma has been busy. He's been going around doing what he does best, torturing and manipulating. He was tempting Lychee with promises of ways to return Arachne to normal, using a mysterious cloaked associate named Phantom to seal and trap Rachel, and now he's showing Tsubaki's visions from another life that she could have lived. One where she became Jin's assistant instead of Noelle, and everything was perfect. It was the exact life that she always wanted, causing Tsubaki to break down and curse Noelle, saying that all the horrible things that had happened to Jin were all her fault. Tsubaki goes off and she ends up fighting Jin, fully giving in to the dark power of the Ezioi. Jin has to finally step up and overcome the influence of his sword, and with the life of his childhood friend on the line, Jin is able to look inside of himself, and on that day, his heart grew three times in size. Okay, more of like... 10%? Eh, a little bit closer to 5. Yeah, Jin's still a total bastard, but at least now, that wasn't the sword making that happen. That was all Jin. He was able to overpower the Yukianasa, and he was now once again in control of his powers, and with these powers he was able to stop Tsubaki. So yes, Jin now no longer had Yukianasa commanding him to kill his brother, meaning Jin could now finally begin his true mission. Of killing his brother. Yeah, remember how I said nothing in Blaze Blue could ever be because of one thing? Well, Jin didn't just have Yukianasa manipulating him, he also had the power of order. Remember that thing from like an hour ago when I said Celica had the power of order and it was just something that the universe gave people to help balance itself and protect itself from threats? Well, there weren't many threats larger than the Black Beast. So Jin didn't just have the Yukianasa whispering in his ear, he had also been chosen by the power of order to be the one to kill Ragna. That's right. Jin had Kill Ragna playing in stereo his entire life. Both the devil and angel on his shoulders were firmly on team Kill Your Brother. Now, it's been a while since we checked in on Kokonoi, and considering it's only been about 12 hours since the last game, she's been very busy. A while back, Tager had found in a destroyed cauldron another Murakumo unit, Lambda 11. Now, Lambda had a super rough life. She was tortured by her creators and was haunted by the memories of her creation until eventually she was shut down. And after hearing about how horrible Morokumo units are treated, it might shock you to learn that Relius Clover was the one who invented them. I know, huge twist, right? If there's something horrible that happened in this universe and it involves science, it was probably Relius Clover. So Kokonoi salvaged Lambda, but Morokumo units need a soul to function, and Lambda was basically just an empty shell at this point. But luckily, another Morokumo unit had just been dumped into the boundary with a fresh soul just sitting right there. So Kokonoi used her super science to reach into the boundary and just took out a sliver of New 13 soul and put it in Lambda. Because of this, Lambda was mostly a mindless obedient robot working for Kokonoi, but every now and again she got a brief flash of memories and feelings that she didn't understand. Oh, also Lambda 11 just happens to look a lot like Ragna and Jin's sister Saya, but at this point, if I bring up a Morokumo unit, just go ahead and assume that. Also, remember Makoto, the squirrel girl who was friends with Tsubaki and Noelle? Yeah, well, she's actually been a double agent this whole time, working for Kokonoi, giving her info from the NOL. Moving over to Noelle, after facing off with Tsubaki, she realizes she had to stop Hazuma. So, she made her way to the top of the NOL base, where another cauldron was waiting. There, Hazma keeps pushing her buttons, mentally torturing her until Noelle eventually breaks. And that's when we learn the truth about Noelle. Her powers start fluctuating wildly, her Noxnic Taurus tries to restrain her, but it can't hold her back anymore. You see, turns out that Noelle was another Morokumo unit. During the Karga Civil War, a Morokumo unit called Mu-12 was being developed in the city of Ibukiro. But its development was interrupted when the Takamagahara system caused the Takimikazuchi to fire down on the city, burning it to the ground. Mu-12 managed to survive though, and thought that thanks to the giant city-destroying attack causing her to be born, she was created with incredibly high power levels, but also had amnesia of who or what she was. 
And so, Mu-12 was adopted into a rich family, given the name Noelle, and now Hazma had broken Noelle's mind, causing her to revert to her original programming. He then shoves Noelle into the cauldron, not to place her into the boundary, but because cauldrons also have another function. Cauldrons act essentially as giant ovens that are used for baking up Morokumos, and Noelle had been taken out before she was done. So Ragna comes racing to stop Hazma, who, by the way, Ragna already knows is actually Yuki Teremi and is the guy who took his sister away when he was a kid and caused Jin to burn down their home and cut off his arm, so even if Noelle wasn't in danger, he'd still be after him. But Rachel had just gotten done telling Ragna that no matter what he does, he can't beat Hazma. It would just be impossible with how he was now. Ragna, being the anime protagonist that he is, doesn't listen when someone tells him that he can't win, and he charges into battle anyway only to immediately learn why he can't win. I don't think so, asshole. You're the one who's gonna eat it! Restriction 666 released. Dimensional interface force field deployed! <laughs> Blaze Blue? That's quite a toy you got there, kiddo. How'd you do that? It sounded like... Restriction 666 released. Deploying dimensional interface force field! What? How did you? No way! <laughs> Time for a taste of real power, boy! Code SOL. Blaze Blue, activate! Yes, it turns out that Yuki Teremi is the one who invented the Blaze Blue, the Azure Grimoire that Ragna used for an arm. And Ragna's was the weak inferior model. Teremi's, on the other hand, was the top-of-the-line state-of-the-art model. But that wasn't the only big reveal. Teremi explains that the Azure Grimoire was basically a portable cauldron. Not just because it allowed access to the Azure inside the boundary, but also because, just like how cauldrons could create Morokumo units, the Azure Grimoire was designed to absorb souls specifically to create the Black Beast. Well... sort of. As I said, the Azure Grimoire was a failed model. It wasn't supposed to create the Black Beast. Much like the Azure Grimoire itself, the Black Beast was also a failed version of what Teremi was actually aiming for. A Kusanagi unit. You remember that from way back? Prime Field Devices were robots designed to explore the boundary. Morokumo units were Prime Field Devices designed for combat. And Kusanagi units were Morokumos designed to kill the Master Unit. This is another reason why New 13 wanted to merge with Ragna. Murakumo units were designed to become Kusanagi units, so the Azure Grimoire was basically calling to her to make her whole, but because the Azure Grimoire was faulty when she and Ragna merged, they didn't become a Kusanagi, they became a Black Beast. I know I'm repeating myself here a lot, but when you get into this many crazy plot points all at once, I feel like that's warranted. But after all this time, Teremi finally had the perfect Murakumo unit and he had a giant cauldron sitting up here on top of the NOL base, which was absorbing the souls of everyone inside the building. With these souls it was gathering up from all the NOL agents, it was going to use them to turn Noel into a Kusanagi. This was it. Ragna had to stop him, or all of existence was going to be destroyed. Ragna couldn't stop him. Yeah, Rachel was right. Ragna couldn't beat Teremi. Ragna got stomped. Not only did Teremi have a better Azure Grimoire, he also was in possession of Ouroboros, another one of the Nox Nectorises. Noel then emerged from the cauldron, now fully transformed into a Kusanagi, and Teremi ordered her to head into the boundary and kill the master unit. So yeah, things were looking bad. But then, as Teremi moved in to deliver the killing blow to Ragna, in jumped Lambda-11. Yeah, as I said, even if it was just a little bit, she did have a sliver of New 13's soul inside of her. Means she did care about Ragna. Even if it was in an obsessed stalker kind of way. So she jumps in and saves him, sacrificing her own life to do it. But as she sacrifices herself, she then merges with Ragna. However, unlike in the last game, this didn't cause Ragna to change into a black beast. No, you see, Kokonoi had equipped Lambda with something known as an Idea Engine, which is a machine that Kokonoi invented for the purpose of matching the power and countering a Nox Nictoris. Thanks to this Idea Engine merging with Ragnar's Azure Grimoire, Ragnar didn't turn into a Black Beast. Instead, he went Super Saiyan. 
He gained a massive power-up and was able to stop Hazma, freed Rachel from her magical prison, and then dove into the boundary to find Mu-12. And he used the power of his grimoire to awaken Noel and bring her back to her senses. He did end up losing his arm in the process, though. Not the Azure Grimoire arm, no, the other real arm. Yeah, Ragna is now 0-2 for keeping his arms from being cut off. But aside from being down one arm, it looks like everything worked out. Noelle was now in control of her body again. Hazma had been defeated. Jin still wanted to kill Ragna and was still a total a-hole, but at least now he was in control of the Yukianasa again. Everybody won, right? Nope, turns out this was all according to Hazma's plans. Or Teremi's plans. Oh god, I'm going to get those two mixed up at some point later on, aren't I? You see, even though both Teremi and the Takamagahara wanted the Master Unit destroyed, Teremi had additional plans that didn't involve him becoming slave to another giant robot god. However, Takamagahara had an impenetrable defense. It had three supercomputers that were constantly observing itself at all times to keep anyone from being able to enter it against their will. But when Ragna fought Mu-12, all three of the AIs turned all of their attention towards that fight. And that's when Teremi snuck in and implanted a computer virus into the machine that wiped out all three of the AIs, leaving the giant satellite with near-god-level observation powers completely unmanned. Teremi then beamed down to visit the injured Ragna, Noel, and Jin, and revealed that while all this was going on, he had been assembling his own Legion of Doom to help him out. There was Relius Clover, the mysterious phantom puppet that he had used to imprison Rachel, Lychee, who had joined him with the promises of returning Arachne back to normal, and Tsubaki, who had been completely overtaken by the dark magic that was corrupting her mind. By the way, in case you're wondering how Teremi was able to plan all this without the Takamagahara system finding out about, it's because remember how I said the Izuyori could steal light? Yeah, that's the reason Teremi needed Tsubaki. Stealing light doesn't just mean making things dark, it also means making it impossible to be seen, even by a god. So, Teremi needed Tsubaki to use the Izayoi's power to block the view of even the omniscient machine god, and that's when Hazma could form these plans. Oh, and in addition to the rest of this rogues gallery that was joining Teremi, there was one other character there. The Emperor of the NOL themselves, who just happens to look a lot like Ragna and Jin's sister, Saya. Saya! Saya, what the hell?! Oh. I guess we finally have a character who doesn't look like Saya, they actually are Saya! Yes, after Teremi kidnapped Saya, he set her up to become the leader of the NOL. Why would he do that? Say it with me, everyone. We'll get to that later. By the way, this has been bugging me ever since I began these videos. We keep getting told all this time that Noel and Nu and Lambda all look just like Saya, and now we finally get to see Saya, and... Am I the only one that doesn't see the resemblance? Like, at all? I don't know, maybe it's just me. So, as the game ends, everyone finds out that they have to leave for Ikarga. Ragnar, Noel, Jin, and most of the other characters head there because that's where Sai and Teremi are head. Bang heads there because he finds out that the son of his master is there. Carl heads there, not just to confront his father, but also to rescue Miss Lychee. Tao... Tao just kind of tags along with Ragna, and I'm sorry, Tal fan, she's a great fun character, but this is the last time I'm going to be mentioning her in this video because she doesn't really play into the plot after this. Point is, everyone is now headed to Ikarga, and that leads us into the next game. By the way, I just want to take a moment real quick to point out, I thought this video was only going to be about an hour long, and we've already cleared that, and we're only halfway through. I'm really bad at this, aren't I? So, yeah, we might have to start going into the Cliff Notes version of the Cliff Notes version. So, Blaze Blue Chrono Phantasma begins with everyone making their way to Ikarga, including Koganoi, who has just been informed by the rest of Sector 7 that her services will no longer be needed. Yeah, Sector 7 might not be a unified team, more of just a bunch of scientists all sharing resources to fight the NOL, but even still, they haven't been too happy with some of Koganoi's actions of late. However, Sector 7 doesn't just give you a pink slip and tell you to pack your stuff in a box and get out. No, if you get fired from Sector 7, you're not walking out of the building alive. And they know that Kokonoi won't go down without a fight. So remember way back when I mentioned that Kokonoi's right-hand man, Tager, lost his entire squad to a powerful villain named Azriel? Well, Azriel has been imprisoned in Sector 7's basement this entire time. 
literally just chilling down there because he's so strong, the only way they could restrain him was to cryogenically freeze him in near absolute zero temperatures. They wake him up and Azrael, being a man obsessed with battle, immediately wants to fight the first person he sees. And considering that Azrael is strong enough to break mountains in half, this would be a death sentence for anyone. But the scientists were smart enough to plan ahead, and before waking him up, they put an Ars Magus on Azrael, making it so he could only fight people that wanted to fight back. Azrael isn't too happy about this, and he ends up breaking one of the guard's shoulders by giving him a gentle pat on the back, and then he sets out to find Kokonoe. She barely escapes with her life, and she makes her way to Ikargo, where she ends up meeting an unlikely ally, Kagura Mutsuki. Kagura is one of the strongest fighters on the planet, a slovenly womanizing party animal, and also the head of the NOL Royal Guard. So why would the head of the NOL Guards want to team up with a member of Sector 7? Uh, ex-member of Sector 7. Because Kagura and Kokonoe have secretly been working together to overthrow the NOL. Why does Kagura want to overthrow the NOL? Well, because A, have you seen the NOL? Even the people that work for them know that they're messed up. But more importantly, because remember how Bang was the number one apprentice of Master Tenjo, the leader of Ikarga? Well, Kagura was the number two apprentice. And while Bang was entrusted with Tenjo's special weapon, a giant nail named Ratenjo that he carries on his back, Kagura was entrusted with Tenjo's son, Homura, and Kagura wants to place Homura in charge of the NOL. Now as for the other heroes, Noel and Makoto join Tager as they're brought to the NOL headquarters in Ikarga and join Kokonoi and Kagura. Bang makes his way to Ikargo with Carl and Platinum the Trinity tagging along. Jin finishes train under Jubei to learn how to use the power of order. A brand new character, Bullet, is investigating what happened to her old captain from her mercenary days, believing he's still alive and working for Sector 7. Spoiler alert, it's Tager if you couldn't figure that out. Another brand new character, Amani Nishiki, is leading a traveling theater troupe through Ikarga at the moment, and surprisingly enough, between Bullet and Amani, Amani is the one who will actually play into the story in a major way later on. And Ragna... Well, Ragna ain't doing too well. Sure, he got the massive power up in the last game, and Kokonoi even replaced his missing arm with a robotic one, but he's having a bit of a crisis of faith. He's finally going off to face Terami and confront his sister, but things aren't sitting well with him, and that's leading to his Azure Grimoire acting up. For the time being, though, he can still fight pretty well, as he ends up facing Ava Tsubaki, who's only saved when Hakuman jumps in to protect her, and then he comes face to face with Terami, who reveals another member of his League of Villains, New 13. Yeah, they reached into the boundary and fished her out, and she's just as murder happy for Ragna as ever. Back to Kokonoi and Kagura, Kokonoi says that Saya and Terami are playing something devastating, and it's going to require a bunch of Seether, so if they want to stop them, they need to find a way to neutralize all Seether. If only there was some way to get rid of all the Seether on the planet. Oh, wait a second. Yes, folks, we're finally at that point where stuff in the prologue is starting to come back and pay off. Kokonoe was going to find Kushinada's linchpin and use it to take away Terami and Saya's power. As well as the power of anyone who uses Ars Magus, but hey, Kokonoe is a scientist who hates magic, so she's okay with that. Also, in case it wasn't clear by now, if you're wondering why Kokonoe is doing this and helping everyone, it's because she knows that Terami and Relias and Saya are all just monsters, and she's been working to stop them for years now. I mean, Kokonoe wasn't really a big fan of her mom, that's why she rejected magic and embraced science, but Terami still killed her mom. Kokonoe is going to be pissed about that no matter what. But you might be wondering, how exactly are they planning on activating the linchpin? I mean, they needed Celica to make it work, and Celica was killed years ago when the church burned down. Well, that's when Kokonoe reveals her secret weapon, Celica Mercury. Yeah, it turns out that long ago, right after the Dark War, Celica found a magic mirror that created a duplicate of Celica's soul and stored it inside of it, which is maybe the most convenient thing I've ever heard of in a video game. Hey, we need this character's soul, but they died years ago. Oh, you didn't know that off-screen, decades ago, their soul was cloned by a magic artifact that we haven't mentioned before? So, yeah, Celica is back and basically is a ghost from the past. A phantasm from another time. A chrono-phantasma, if you will. That's the name of the game. So, it looks like our heroes have a plan, but they need to hurry, because now there's suddenly a brand new problem they're facing. Saya has started warping space and time. 
Yeah, remember the Takamagahara system? The floating satellite that had the power to create massive phenomena interventions? Well, the three AI programs that were controlling it have been deleted. So Saya has moved right in and made herself at home, enjoying the new perks of being able to shift reality around at her whim. Now, she wasn't making huge changes or anything, she wasn't wiping people from existence or anything like that, but our heroes did find themselves looking around and suddenly asking, What the? Did everything just jump around? Or did my brain just stroke off there for a second? You know this is a weird episode where I'm using Futurama clips instead of Simpson clips. So, in other words, they realized time was running out. Now, from here on, there's tons of character interaction stuff, and hey, that's all great, really explores these characters, but again, I'm going to skip most of that because we need to move this video along. But a few things of importance did happen, such as Bang finding Relius Clover and learning from him the truth about the Ikarga War that wasn't started because the people of Ikarga won independence, but because Sector 7 and the NOL waged a war with each other, and both of them needed souls. Now, I'll get to why the NOL needed souls soon, but Sector 7 needed them because they were trying to create a Black Beast. And as I said, Black Beasts require a bunch of sacrifices. In fact, remember how I said Takamagahara fired Takimikazuchi down on the village in Ibukido and wiped it off the face of the earth? That's because that's where the Black Beast was being created and they almost succeeded, so Takamagahara had to step in. And Bang does not take kindly to learn that his people were sacrificed just for some madman's quest for power. Ragnar runs into Selika, and suddenly he can't use his right arm, the arm with the Azure Grimoire on it, because as we've established, Selika's mere presence neutralizes Seether. Ragnar is then captured by Kagura and taken back to Inowel's base, where Rachel appears and, as always, gives some really vague hints about what's going on, telling them a story about a girl who's reading a book, and that book has a beginning and an ending, but all the pages in the middle have been ripped out. The story starts with a princess being kidnapped, and then it ends with the hero killing a monster, only to reveal that the princess was the monster. And the young girl tries to rewrite the story to save the princess, but the end is already written, meaning it will always end like that. Why does she tell them this story? Because it's a metaphor for everything that's going to happen later. Kokonoi tells Ragnar that they'll release him from his cell, but he has to stick around, and to make sure that he doesn't leave, she puts Selika in charge of watching over him. And more importantly, she tells Ragnar that if he gets too far away from Selika, then a bomb that she planted in his robot arm will go off. This is all a lie though, there is no bomb, but she's worried that Ragnar might lose control of the Azure Grimoire, and she knows that Selika can keep it neutralized. Also, in case anyone is wondering, Ragnar has no idea who Selika is, because she's back to being a teenager and he only knew her as an adult, and since she went on to be a nun, he never actually knew her name when he was growing up, he always just called her sister. Jin continues his journey to Ikarga, and along the way he runs into Hakumen. During their encounter, he confirms his suspicions that Hakumen is him from a different timeline. He asks Hakumen about Tsubaki and the Ezioi to try and find some hint of how to snap her out of her dark moody emo phase. Jin then arrives at the NOL base and joins everyone else, and the gang now starts playing to take down Saya. I want to remind everyone right now, for the sake of time, I'm skipping a whole lot of character bonding moments that are very nice and they flesh out these characters, but there's a ton of it in here, and we just don't have time for it. If you pick these games up for yourself, then I encourage you to check these story modes out just to get these characters fleshed out, because yeah, it's some really good stuff. Back to the bullet points, Rachel helps Noelle train her new Morokumo and Observer powers, but while they're training, Noelle is attacked by Arachne. Why is Arachne there? Because Relia's Clover captured him, turned him into his servant, and then equipped him with an idea engine. Remember that thing that Lambda had that was basically the anti Noxnik Taurus tech? Yeah, now Arachne was upgraded from sludgy foot soldier to boss monster. But Noelle is rescued by Kagura, who smacks Arachne away. Kagura then meets with Bang that night, and the two former disciples of Tinjo discuss Kagura's plan to overthrow the NOL, and reveal Tinjo's son Hamura to be safe and in his care. They tell Bang to head to a specific location and wait there with the nail that his mentor had given him, and they say that when the time was right, he would know what to do with it. So, now it was time for our heroes to start their plan. First up, they had to save Tsubaki, but they also had to deal with Azriel, who was on a one-man warpath across the country to find Kokonoi. Well, Kagura had a plan to kill two birds with one stone. They had Ragnar in their possession, and he had the highest bounty in the world, meaning a lot of people wanted to catch him and turn him in. But since Kagura was still the head of the NOL guards, it meant Ragnar was already in NOL custody. So Kagura announced a fighting tournament, because it was the only anime trope this series was missing. He said that whoever won this tournament could turn Ragnar in and get the bounty on his head. 
This brought Tsubaki there as a member of the NOL to oversee everything, and it also drew Azrael's attention. But more importantly, this tournament had another purpose. As I said, Saya was now in control of the Takamagahara, meaning she could create massive phenomena interventions, making it next to impossible to stop her. She was strong enough to reshape an entire city all at once, but not strong enough to reshape the entire world. At least, not yet. So, if they televised this tournament to the entire world and made sure it had as many people watching as possible, then Saya couldn't use her observer powers to reshape anything going on. Yeah, basically when you use observer powers, you make something true that wasn't true. So if you're standing around just two or three people, your observer powers can convince them that whatever you're observing into reality is real. You're affecting what you're observing as well as everything around it. But when the entire world is tuning in and watching something, your observer powers won't work on it because too many people from outside your range of influence can see it and would know that you changed something. So the tournament begins and Noelle, Makoto, and Jin face off with Tsubaki. Noelle uses her new Eye of the Azure powers to observe the evil that is taking over Tsubaki's mind, causing her to transform into the embodiment of the Izuyoi itself, at which point Jin comes in and reaches out to her. Tsubaki is able to awaken inside the Izuyoi and regain her senses. Turns out it wasn't the Izuyoi that was brainwashing Tsubaki. Remember how Teremi was being forced to fight for the heroes during the Dark War because Nine put a spell on him? Saya had done the exact same thing to Tsubaki, but thanks to her friend, she was able to break free of her control. But then there's the matter of the giant muscle man that was rampaging in the stadium. Azrael jumps in and starts going for Ragna, and for a moment it looks like Ragna is about to lose control of the Azure Grimoire but he's able to pull through it, making his allies think that maybe he can control this power after all. Kagura then comes in and goes a few rounds with Azrael, but once he realizes the spell that Azrael is under, he simply refuses to fight. This causes Azrael to lose all of his powers and he can no longer fight anymore, and Kokonoi is now able to teleport him away. So, things were starting to move along, but before our heroes could take the fight to Sai and Terami, they had to get Ragna in fighting shape. So Rachel takes Ragna, Selika, and Noel to the destroyed cauldron of Ibukido, in other words, where Noel was created. Using a whole bunch of crazy magical stuff that I won't get into, Rachel and Selika are able to send Ragna back in time. Now, hey, remember way, way back in the prologue when I mentioned that Selika a hundred years ago found an injured man named Blood Edge who she healed back to life? Yep. That was Ragna. Ragna got sent a hundred years into the past where he lost his memories. He only remembered that he was called Blood Edge, but he still felt something towards Selika and he knew he had to help her. So he escorted Selika on her quest to find her father, met her sister Nine and Trinity and a young Jubei, and eventually they all found Kushina's linchpin. But upon finding it, they learned that Selika would die if she activated it. Upon hearing this, Ragnar regained all of his memories and he couldn't let Selika sacrifice herself, so he told them that he had a way to stop the Black Beast for one year, and in that year, they had to find a way to stop the Black Beast that didn't involve killing Selika. So Ragnar confronted the Black Beast, was absorbed into it, and it turns out that ingesting yourself isn't that good for you because it caused the Beast to shut down for an entire year, and you all know what happened from there. So Ragnar died in the past? Yes, and also no, because in the present, Noel was able to use the Eye of the Azure to observe Ragna still being alive, which brought him back. Now, you might be thinking, wait, so if you're an observer, then you can resurrect the dead? Well, if you have god-level observer powers, then sure, you can reshape all of reality. But nobody in our cast of characters has that level of power just yet. The reason why Noel was able to bring Ragna back was because even though he spent days in the past, in our time, he was only gone for a second. So basically, she didn't really bring him back to life, he just disappeared and then she observed a reality where he was still there. Which also explains why he still has his coat and sword with him despite hanging them off to Selika in the past. But when Ragnar came back, he returned with his memories of the past, and upon realizing that Selika would have to sacrifice herself, he realizes he has to protect her. And not just her, but everyone else. Yeah, again, I'm skimming over all the character interaction stuff, but over the course of this game, Selga and Ragnar start to get really close with each other, and realizing that he has to protect her, that's what clears up the emotional fog that's been plaguing Ragnar throughout this entire game. So now, Ragnar was finally ready to fight again, and he wasn't the only one. You might have been thinking to yourself, hey, there's a group of characters who we haven't talked about in a while. And you're right, because as all of this was happening, 
the six heroes were reuniting with a plan to take down Terami. Hakuman, Valgenhain, Jubei, and Platinum, now with Trinity in control, all teamed up at Rachel's Manor, and after Trinity met with Celica and got some emotional closure, they all headed out. Using Trinity's Nox Nectoris, which enhances her alchemic abilities, they separated Hazma and Terami. They need to do this because if they just destroyed Hazma, then Terami would still survive in his spirit form. They had to turn Terami's spirit by into a solid form and then destroy it. It looked like they succeeded, however Trinity was injured as a result. But in the process of all this, the heroes came face to face with Phantom. Yeah, remember the magical puppet that Terami and Relius were carrying around? Well, the heroes confronted it and learned that the puppet was actually Nine. Terami had fished her out of the boundary and then had Relius turn her into a puppet. Now, back to Ragna, he confronted Kokonoi and is angry that she was actually willing to sacrifice Celica to use the linchpin. At which point, Rachel appears and tells them that there is actually another way to activate it. Yes, the machine does need a soul, but there's another soul out there that can sync up with the linchpin, and that soul belongs to someone who was already dead, and they had stored their soul inside of a Nox Nectoris just for this exact occasion. But what was this Nox Nectoris, and where could they find it? I mean, all we know is that it's shaped like a giant nail, and who has a Nox Nectoris shaped like a giant... Oh. Yes, when Tinjo entrusted the giant nail Retinjo to Bang and told him that it was the spirit of Ikarga, turns out that was literal. The nail housed Tinjo's soul inside because they realized it might be needed for this exact occasion. So Ragna, Selka, and Noel head off to meet Bang where Kagura told him to wait. And in case you're wondering right now, wait, so Kagura told Bang to take the nail to Kushina's linchpin, but he didn't know that the nail would work on Kushina's linchpin? He knew that the nail would be needed to make Kushina's linchpin work, but they thought they also needed Selika's soul. He didn't know that there was already a soul also inside the nail that would also work. Do you see what I mean when I say everything in Blaze Blue has way too many steps to it? Ragnar confronts Bang, and after a quick scuffle, they reveal that the Retinjo is the key to saving the world. He just has to drive it into the linchpin. Bang doesn't quite understand, but he agrees to go along with it, trusting in what his allies have told him, only for them to be interrupted by Relius Clover, with Lychee backing him up. So that situation gets bad quick, and it isn't looking much better for the other heroes. Kagura, Jin, Hibiki, Kagura's assistant who's been here the entire time but I couldn't find a good spot to introduce him into the summary, and Hamura are confronted by Saya who quickly beats them. But when she sees Hamura, she realizes, oh, you're the kid of Tinjo. Wait, so you were planning on overthrowing me and putting Hamura in charge? Well, you know what? I'm feeling generous today. So Saya broadcasts herself to the entire world and tells them, listen, I'm stepping down as the head of the NOL, and I'm handing my position over to Hamura. You all think that this will lead to a perfect world? That's great. I think you humans are just wonderful with your little goals and your dreams and whatnot. So go, go make your little utopia, and I'll give you my parting gift, death. Okay, time to finally explain who, or more accurately, what Saya is. Saya is just the outer shell of this creature. On the inside, she is actually the god of death, Hades Izanami. You see, when the Takamagahara unit freed Yuki Terami, they believed he could help them bring about Doomsday, a prophesized day in which the god of death would be able to kill the master unit. Now, Terami was on board with this, except for the part about having to work for the Takamagahara system, but he already took care of that. So, in order for this to happen, they would have to create a vessel that the God of Death could inhabit. Relius Clover attempted to create such a body with an early Murokumo unit, however, it didn't work. But something else surprising happened. The Murokumo unit he created had three children. Yes, apparently Murokumo units can have children, but the process by which it's possible is really weird and even I don't fully understand it. Important thing is, it happened. And as you can probably guess, these three children were Ragna, Jin, and Saya. And even though Jubei rescued them and took them to safety, Terami found them and realized that the one in a million offspring of a Morokumo unit could be just what they needed. So he kidnapped Saya for this experiment and gave Jin the sword that he could use to burn the home down and cut his brother's arm off and kill Selika. 
because Teremi didn't have a body just yet, so he needed something to keep him in this world. Something permanent that would always be there. And that thing was a grudge. He stole Saya to be the body for Izanami and then made Jin attack Ragna so that way Ragna would keep Teremi in his mind 24 7, allowing Teremi to keep living in this world. That's right, Teremi did all those horrible things to Ragna so that way he could literally live rent free in his mind. And so, Teremi and Relius used Saya to be a vessel for Izanami. And then they used their own influence, as well as some help from the Takamagahara system manipulating things, to get Izanami to rise in the ranks until they became the head of the NOL. And in addition to that, they also realized that if Saya's body was perfect for housing this god, then it must be the peak design for Morokumo units. So they would base all future Morokumo units on her, which is why Noel, Nu, and Lambda all look like Saya. And after Juve told Ragna that the NOL was making robot versions of his sister in the cauldrons, that's why Ragna decided to suit up and go out and destroy all the cauldrons. Also because the cauldrons were going to be used for something else. You see, I mentioned that the NOL had bases all around the world, and each of these bases had cauldrons inside them, and cauldrons made more Okumo units, but as we saw when Noel got turned into Mu-12 in the last game, these cauldrons can also absorb souls. So putting all these cauldrons around the world was all for this day when Izanami would have the cauldrons activate and absorb the souls of everyone around the world. Bringing all these souls to a focal point, creating a large swirling mass of energy called the embryo. What was the embryo going to do? A whole bunch of complicated stuff that I'm not going to get into here, but the important thing is it would summon the master unit out of the boundary and into this world where it could be killed. Oh, and to make matters worse, remember the giant monster in the satellite in space, Takimi Kazuchi? Yeah, Izanami calls the satellite down, crashing it into the Earth, and now Takimi Kazuchi is here and ready to start destroying anyone that tries to stop her plans. So, okay, Izanami, god of death, sucking up the souls of everyone on Earth. The master unit, here in our reality, ready to be killed. Taki Mikazuchi, down on Earth, stopping anyone from getting close to Izanami. The only way to stop all of this was to shove the Retinjo nail into the linchpin, then for Kokonoi to teleport the linchpin right to where Izanami was. Problem is, Relius and Lychee aren't letting our heroes anywhere near the linchpin. But then, the cavalry finally arrives. Someone appears to help turn the tide of battle. It's Carl! Yes, Bang had been a friend to Carl when no one else would, and he provided Carl with support and encouragement when he needed it most, acting almost as a mentor to him. And now, when Bang needed help, he arrived to, oh, wait, no, he, he's actually joining the villains. Yeah, Carl betrays Bang's trust and decides to join Relius, so that way he can help teach him how to turn his sister back to normal, and to protect Lychee, who reminds him of his sister. So yeah, things just became even worse for the good guys. But then Makoto and Tsubaki arrive, allowing Ragna, Noel, and Saga to head off to face Izanami and the Taki Mikazuchi. Bang, Tsubaki, and Makoto face off with Relius, Carl, and Lychee, but they're at a standstill. Neither side is giving an inch, and time is running out. Bang has to activate the linchpin now or else all is lost. It looks truly hopeless for our heroes, but then Valkenhayn jumps in to hold off Relius, allowing Bang to jump on top of the linchpin just before Kokonoi teleports it away. At that moment, Bang puts everything he has into hammering the nail directly into the linchpin, and Bang, the guy who has largely been treated as a joke throughout this entire series, ends up saving the day. Master, grant me this boon. Let my request be met with favor! <sighs> Master, let my spirit reach you for love and justice! Phoenix! Potential!
Well, almost. This is able to stop the cauldrons from sucking up everyone's souls, but there's still the matter of the master unit here in our reality about to be killed and the giant kaiju that's rampaging around. Ragnar Jin and Noel team up and they're able to stop the Takimikazuchi though. Then Rachel jumps in and once again summons the giant shield Tsukuyomi to save the master unit. Again, I'd like to remind everyone, yes, there's about 10 other things going on right now that involve many other characters, but we're skipping all that in order to keep this as simple as possible. Ragnar, Jin, and Noel then move on to finally face Izanami. Only for Izanami to then cause the Black Beast to awaken inside of Ragnar. So, in the twilight moments of this crisis, Ragna is overcome by the Black Beast and Jin and Noel have to stop him or else all is lost. This is lining up to be the most dramatic battle in the entire franchise. Cut to the dramatic battle now. Yeah, you don't actually get to see any of that fight. Instead, we cut to after the battle, where Izanami has escaped, no one can use Ars Magus anymore because all the Seether is gone, except of course for a handful of lucky people who apparently were just chosen by the Azure to still wield their powers? Translation, all the characters that you can play as in the game? So the world is kind of in disarray, and speaking of disarray, Jin was smacked around so badly by the Black Beast Ragna that he's now bedridden and he may never wake up again. And Ragna? Well, Ragnar wakes up in a vast wasteland, looks up and sees the giant embryo that Izanami was creating out of all the souls still just hanging up there in the air, and Ragnar has no memory of who he is. And that is Chrono Phantasma. Easily the biggest story so far in these games, but thankfully we finally start to explain all that stuff that I've been pulling off for later. Which means we only have one more game to go, the epic finale, and things are about to get even weirder. Now, before we get into the final game, Central Fiction, I just want to remind everyone that these are fighting games. I know, a little hard to remember that when hour two of a story recap is on the horizon, but this does mean that some stuff might happen in the story that makes you think, why on earth would you do that? But it's all to justify how these games can keep every character from the previous games coming back for the roster. And hey, the fact that these games kept every single character coming back for every single game is one of the best things about Blaze Blue from a fighting game perspective. From a story perspective, it's one of the worst things because it leads to just some really bizarre justifications for how characters can still be here or what decisions characters end up making. So all right, final game, Central Fiction, here we go. Ragnar the Blood Edge, missing in without his memories. Jin, finally woken up, but he's injured and unable to walk anymore. Noel. Actually, Noel's doing okay. Oh, no way, she actually lost all of her powers and she has no memory of how that happened. Ah, yeah, just a big day for taking L's, isn't it? Jin doesn't want to accept what's happened to him. He says he still must kill Ragna before he can die, which causes Tsubaki, who, again, is in love with Jin and 100% loyal to him, to set out on her own quest to kill Ragna. But then Jin is visited by the spirit of Trinity Glassfield. Yeah, after her run-in with Hazma and Terry in the last game, and yes, we do need to start referring to them as separate people now, Trinity was separated from Platinum. So here's the thing. Platinum was a body that Trinity created to house the souls of Luna and Sinna while keeping her own body in the Noxnic Taurus in order to stabilize that body. But now that Trinity had been separated from her Noxnic Taurus, Luna and Sinna were fading away. So Trinity offered Jin a deal. She would heal his body, and in exchange, he would carry her soul in his sword until they were able to find Platinum and reunite them. Trinity warns him though that if she does this, he would only be healed temporarily, and by the time the healing powers wore off, he would die. Jin doesn't care about any of that though, he just has one question. If I take this deal, would I be able to kill Ragna? And she says, sure, I don't see why not. And he says, that's all I need to hear, deal. So while Jin was heading out to face Ragna again, all the other heroes were assembling to discuss how to stop Izanami. This is certainly setting up to be an exciting final showdown, right? Well, remember how Izanami had gathered all those souls together and they were just floating up there, menacingly? Well, that was all she needed for her final plan, because just as the heroes had assembled again, Izanami used the power of the embryo to create a time loop. Yes, Izanami sucked everyone into the embryo, and next thing you know, Ragna is waking up on his way to the hierarchical city of Kagatsuchi. He still has no memories of who he is though, but everyone keeps telling him that he's supposed to go to Kagatsuchi and destroy the cauldron, so he just kind of goes along with it for now. 
And so, he goes to Kagatsuchi, he buys Talkaka food, he fights Arachne, fights Carl, it's all the greatest hits. And nobody has any idea that they're stuck in a time loop. Except for Jin, who remembers everything because he has the power of order. In fact, I'll jump ahead a bit here now and say, Jin is able to find Platinum, and he is able to use the power of order to keep them from fading away like Marty McFly. How does the power of order keep them from fading away? Good question. Yeah, listen, there's a lot in Blaze Blue that isn't properly explained, and the power of order is at the top of that list. It's basically a deus ex machina ability that lets people do whatever the writer needs them to do in that moment. But essentially, it allows him to observe them back into existence. I'll just go ahead and leave it at that, because observing is the end-all be-all ability in this franchise, and I guess the power of order gives him that now too. So everyone is living their lives from the first game again, with some small changes here and there, but as Ragna is making his way to the cauldron, he's starting to remember his past. And what he can't remember, everyone is more than happy to remind him of. They tell him about the cauldrons that he's destroyed, about the cities that were wrecked because of this, and the hundreds upon hundreds of NOL soldiers that Ragna killed in cold blood. Yeah, this was actually kind of a shocking moment when I played through it, because, okay, his name is Ragnar the Blood Edge, that sounds pretty edgy, and I knew he had a massive bounty on his head from destroying the cauldrons, but I never really thought it that far through. That's about as far as I went with it. I hadn't really stopped to think about it until now, but yeah, those cauldrons were guarded. By people. People Ragnar probably sliced right through. But even if I had thought of it that way, I probably would have assumed that Ragnar had just, I don't know, knocked the guards out or snuck past them. I mean, this is our protagonist. We followed him for three games now, and sure, he's been kind of a gruff jerk at times. Okay, most of the time. But we always saw that when push came to shove, he had a good heart to him. So when the game turns to you and says, oh no, he's got one of the highest body counts in recorded history, yeah, it's kind of shocking. I mean, okay, sure. Lots of video games have characters who fight off armies of bad guys, and yes, if you stop and think about it, sure, you're killing those bad guys. But you never look at Nathan Drake and think, oh yeah, that guy is one of the biggest mass murderers in history. And that's because those games never turn to you and say, you are playing a murderer. Those random enemies were people. They had lives. And your character killed them. And Ragna was shocked too. You can tell as the story goes on that this is hitting him hard. And then when he finally reaches the cauldron and he fights New 13, he doesn't try to destroy her. Instead, he reaches his hand out and says he wants to save her. Yeah, remember that story that Rachel told Ragna in the last game and I said it would all come back around? Yeah, here it comes. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not entirely sure what it was that made Ragna change his ways here. Maybe it was because he didn't have his memories, so he didn't have a truckload of emotional damage telling him to destroy his sister's robot clones. Maybe it was because in the back of his mind he still had the experience of the last few days of meeting Celica and Noel and so many other people that inspired him to be a better person. Maybe it's because he just spent the last 24 hours with people telling him that he was a horrible person who had done horrible things and he decided he didn't want to be that person anymore. Whatever it was, he broke the time loop on the first try and tried to help New instead of killing her. Which shocked Nine the Phantom a whole lot. Yeah, Nine was now acting on her own, probably because being inside the embryo broke whatever control Relius and Termi had over her. I'll admit it's not entirely fully explained and I'm a little bit hazy on it, but all that you need to know is that she's back, she's in control of her body again, but guess what? Nine had kind of gone nuts from being in the boundary for an entire century, and now she was firmly on team burn everything to the ground. She breaks the illusion that everyone was under in the time loop and tells our heroes the reason you're here is because you've been chosen by the Azure, and one of you will become the one to inherit the Azure. And that means you'll get to recreate the entire world in whatever way you want. So your greatest, wildest dreams can all become real. But if you want to do that, then you have to make your way to Izanami and kill her. Oh, and one more thing. Doomsday is still happening. Yeah, you guys didn't stop that. The master unit is still trapped in here with all of us, and every second it's here, the closer it gets to dying and taking the whole universe with it. So you're on the clock, chop chop, you better kill Izanami quick. 
However, as soon as she tells everyone this, another phenomena intervention happens and everyone gets shuffled around. Ragna meets up with Bang, and the two of them start traveling back to Ikarga. Noelle meets up with her old schoolmate Mai, who is a great character, but all of her backstory happens in a manga that doesn't really hold any importance to anything else that's going on right now, so sadly, I'm going to skip over her. And speaking of that, Celica ends up meeting up with Naoto Kurogane. Naoto comes from a light manga spinoff, but he actually does play into the story a tad. So, real quick, he's essentially an alternate reality version of Ragna, and he's been sent into this world to try and find his friend Raquel, who is his reality's version of Rachel. The main reason I'm bringing him up is because, as I said, the Master Unit is dying and all of reality is crumbling away, but the reason Izanami isn't able to speed up the destruction of the world is because of Naoto. Since he comes from another reality, he's thrown a monkey wrench into this world's destruction. Think of it like this. If you're trying to melt a stick of butter in the microwave, but then someone throws in there a sheet of tinfoil, it's going to cause problems. Izanami is trying to run program worlddestruction.exe, but it keeps running into this one file that it can't identify, so it can't progress further. On his way to face Izanami, Ragnar runs into Rachel, but unfortunately, they also run into Asriel, who was able to free himself from Kokonoe's trap when the world got sucked into the embryo. Things look bad, especially for Rachel, who is quickly losing her powers. Yeah, you remember how I said that she has crazy godly powers because she was the bystander? Well, those powers have been leaving Rachel ever since she got sucked into this world. But that's not because of the embryo, or Izanami, or the Master Unit, or anything else like that. That's because Rachel was a bystander, and part of the deal of being a bystander was that you couldn't interfere with the course of the world. And I don't know if you've been paying attention, but Rachel has been interfering a lot with the course of the world. So eventually, the universe just goes, alright, you've been warned, Rachel, you're fired, you're no longer the bystander. Hey, who was that dancer that was leading that theater troupe? Yeah, they'd probably be fine with just sitting back and watching the world play out. Yep, remember Amani Nishiki from the last game? That's the new bystander. So Ragna is going to have to face out with Azriel alone, or so he thinks. Adriel says he wants Ragna to get stronger before fighting him, and at that moment, Ragna is then teleported away, as he is then summoned by the Master Unit to fight Izanami. Although Izanami is confused to see him here, because only the Chosen can exist within this world, and only the Chosen can face her. But Ragna wasn't Chosen, which might be why he lost his memories when he got sucked into the embryo. So Ragna faces off with Izanami, and even though Ragna had planned on killing Saya for years, after everything he had gone through, he decided he now wanted to save her. But Izanami just laughs this off and says that's not possible. And then she dives onto Ragna's sword. It appears she's killed herself only for another Phenomena intervention to start. Izanami says this is because that girl did not wish for this outcome. Who is that girl? Izanami tells Ragna to look into her eyes. And upon staring into them, Ragna sees a woman strung up, and Izanami reveals that is a Madarasu. That is the master unit itself. That is what is inside the giant robot god. It's a young woman who looks exactly like Noel. Izanami then reveals that all of this was a trick. That this promise that you'll get your greatest wish and you'll get to reshape the universe as you want if you defeat her is impossible. Because Izanami is the drive of the master unit. That would mean a lot more to you if you knew what a drive was. Okay, time for more explaining. In the game itself, drive is an ability that every single character has that's unique to them. But speaking in terms of the story, a drive is a power within your soul that the Azure gives shape to. At least that's how the game defines it, but I understand that that sounds really, really vague. Basically, if your soul is strong, then the Azure can bless you with a unique power. But you can also develop this drive ability if you get close enough and touch the Azure, then your soul will form some new power based on this exposure. It's really confusing, but all you need to know is basically Izanami is a part of the Master Unit's soul, so you can't destroy one without destroying the other, and remember, if you destroy the Master Unit, you destroy the world. So I guess the easiest way to explain it is, think of it like this. Izanami is the Master Unit's stand. Some of you are probably still very confused, and some of you now understand it perfectly. Izanami was created from the Master Unit's anger, hatred, longing for their existence to end, so they created a god of death. 
And now that God of Death was making it so the only way to defeat her was for the Master Unit to die. And so another Phenomena intervention happened, and Ragnar was sent back in time to when he was traveling with Bang a few hours earlier. And he realizes once again they were stuck in a time loop with everyone going on to fight and kill Izanami. But every time they tried to kill her, those fighters would experience torment. They wouldn't get their greatest wish, they would only see their worst nightmares. And then they'd be sent back in time just like him. One thing I really enjoy about Blaze Blue is that every single character's arcade mode is actually canon. I mentioned in Calamity Trigger every character's story and arcade modes were part of the time loop, but this continues on in every single game. In Continuum Shift, you see different paths for every single character playing out in the arcade mode, but that's because those are the different possibilities that Noel was observing into existence. In Chrono Phantasma, every single character has a unique boss fight at the end of that that shows their own different path, and now in Central Fiction, whenever each character faces off with Izanami in the arcade mode, that's basically their ticket being called and them going up for their turn to defeat her. Now, you've probably got some questions. Who am I kidding? We all have questions. We have nothing but questions at this point. But there's one question in particular you probably have above all others right now. Who was that girl that looked like Noelle inside the Master Unit? Alright, Blaze Blue has a ton of backstory. There's so much that happened before the very first game, and we already went over a good chunk of it. But we're now going further than we ever have before. To the biggest reveal of the game, the thing that makes you look at this entire series completely different. You ready? You ready for the big reveal? The thing that will change the way that you look at this game forever? The thing this entire series was about? Here it comes, get ready! He's been sitting there ever since you left this morning. Just like he does every day. In a world of his own. Shout out to the five people out there who are interested in learning the lore of Blaze Blue and are also familiar with what St. Elsewhere is. The tiny sliver of people in the overlap of that Venn diagram are currently losing their minds. Yes, folks, the entire world of Blaze Blue isn't the real world. Well, it is, but it wasn't the original real world. It was a fake world created by the Master Unit after the original world was destroyed. Yes, when Teremi originally escaped from the Master Unit, he manipulated scientists into discovering the boundary, and there they found the Looney Tune-style human-shaped hole in the wall that he left when he broke out. These scientists realized this was a way for them to gain ultimate power and be like gods. So they tried to explore the boundary, but quickly learned that humans couldn't survive in it. So they created the Prime Fuel Devices, and they sent their first model out, who from this point forward will be referred to as the Original, and the Original made contact with the Master Unit and merged with it. The scientists were excited because they assumed this meant that they would be the ones controlling the Master Unit, but just like how Susanoo started as an empty suit of armor and then slowly grew a soul, the Azure in the Boundary caused the Original to also grow a soul, and it didn't want to obey these scientists. And because all the Prime Field devices are linked, the Original's Awakening caused all the other Prime Field devices to grow their own souls and minds and start thinking for themselves as well. But don't worry, these Prime Field devices just wanted to be friends. They wanted to work with humans and to be treated as equals, like living beings with rights and dignity. To which the humans said, It's bringing love, don't let it get away! Break its legs! <laughs> Yep, humans being humans proceeded to fear people they did not understand and declared war on the Prime Field Devices. And so the original had to sit there in the boundary and watch as their own kind was slaughtered. But the humans went a bit overboard in this war. Not only did they build their own fake robot god, the Takamagahara, to try and rival the Master Unit, but they also wanted to build a greater weapon than the Prime Field Devices to wipe them all out. That greater weapon? The Black Beast. Yes, the very first Black Beast was created to try and take out the Prime Field Devices, and surprise, surprise, the humans couldn't control it. It ended up rampaging across the entire world, destroying every single human until the Earth was nothing more than a flaming, scorched wasteland. Experiencing a great sadness over all this, the original used the power of the Azure to create a brand new world as if none of this had ever happened, and nobody would ever know about the past. Except for Yuki Terami, who, remember, is immune to Phenomena Interventions, meaning even though the rest of the world was rewritten around him, he stuck around, ready to try and destroy the world all over again, and this time, take the Master Unit with it. But wait! 
All this universal crane dream logic goes even deeper. I mentioned Izanami was a part of the original. Well, so were all of the other Morokumo units. Izanami was the original's response to the death and destruction she had witnessed. Lambda was the embodiment of the sadness she had experienced. New was... Okay, I've been told two different things about this one. I've seen people say that New was the original wanting someone to come and rescue her, which is why she's so lovestruck over Ragna. But then that raises some questions about why she also wants to kill Ragna. But then I've seen other people saying that New was the original's longing for a family, which makes her obsession with Ragna even creepier. Ew! So, uh, yeah, I'm going to stick with that first theory that she's her longing for someone to come and rescue her, because then it at least makes that moment where Ragna offers to save New kind of sweet. And Noel was the original's longing to be treated as a normal human being, but here's the big reveal. Ragna? Yeah. He is 100% a creation of the original, and I don't mean like how everything in this world was created by the original. No, I mean Ragna was specifically handmade, custom ordered by the original to be the person to come and rescue her. Yeah, he is the valiant knight in that story that Rachel was talking about in the last game. In other words, he's the character that the original created to be the center of this entire story. He is the central fiction. That's why every time that the Takamagahara needed to reset the time loop, they would destroy Kagatsuchi. Because even if this was a time loop where Ragna didn't become the Black Beast, that attack would still end up killing him, and that would force the original to reset the loop to try and save Ragna. It's also probably another reason why Terami made sure to torture Ragna as a kid but not kill him. If he killed him, it would reset the loop. But by torturing him and filling him with rage, it made sure that it turned him into a dark, angry edgelord who wanted to kill people, rather than a heroic knight in shining armor that wanted to save people. It'd be like if Lex Luthor wanted to mess with Superman, but he knew he couldn't kill him, so he just goes back in time and tells him, Hey, listen man, ignore all that stuff that your parents are telling you about caring about other people. It's all about looking out for number one, kid. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. This would also explain why when Ragna confronts Izanami and said he wanted to save her, Izanami threw herself on his sword because actually saving Izanami and the original is what the original wanted all along. So if that happened, then the world might actually be saved, and Izanami can't have that. And these aren't even the only little tidbits that we can look at and go, oh, I think they were hinting at this being true all along. If you go back to some of the early games, they flat out spell this out for you. You just don't understand what they're talking about just yet. This world is nothing but lies, 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 lies! Hmm. You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd say Teremi was trying to tell us something. So! Whew! Okay. I promise you that is the last big massive reveal. Time to race towards the finish line of this story. So Ragnar gets sucked into a small pocket dimension created by Hazma. Not Teremi, though, because remember after the events of the last game, Hazma and Teremi are now two separate people. Hazma is basically the same as Teremi though, but he's less pissed off and he's more mischievous. Yeah, something to point out, Teremi isn't quite the same person depending on what body he's in. His personality is always merged with whoever he's combined with. So even though Hazma was a puppet created to be Teremi's body, now that they're separated, they are acting slightly different from each other. And they're not the only ones divided up because Hazma has kidnapped Mu-12. You mean Noel? No, I don't! Mu-12 and Noel became separated in the embryo, so Ragnar takes Mu with him to be reconnected with Noel, who is about to have a very bad day, because all these people trying to challenge Izanami are now being given a brand new mission. If you really want your dreams to come true, you have to kill Noel, and many of them actually tried to do it. Yes, yeah, some of the heroes who we have been following throughout these games finds out they have to kill Noel to get what they want, and many of them agree to it. Yeah, it's kind of messed up, but I will say when Ragnar confronts Bang, he's like the one character who says he won't do it. Yeah, he could have his home back, his nation could be rebuilt, his master and his clan could be revived, but he would never ever consider harming an innocent woman to make that happen. Bang Shishigami, treated like a joke, but he's the realest dude in this entire series. So Ragnar has to protect Noel now but he has an idea. Remember, the Azure Grimoire has the power to absorb souls, but with some concentration, Ragnar can absorb just a part of the soul, specifically a person's dreams. 
And I don't mean the dreams that you have when you're asleep. No, I mean your goals. The things that you want most in this world. In other words, the things that all these characters are fighting for. So Ragnar goes from one character to another, fighting them and then stealing away their memories of the things that they want the most, making them no longer interested in fighting Izanami or Noel and trying to get the Azure. However, he is also stealing everyone's dreams for another reason that I'll get to later. That is the final I'll get to it later in this video, I promise. So, now that Ragnar has snapped everyone back to their senses, they all team up again and Noel and Mu-12 merge back together. They realize that the only way to stop Izanami is to stop the Phenomena Interventions. Now the Master Unit was causing some of them, but Nine was causing the rest of them. So they had to go and stop Nine and destroy her Noxnic Taurus, Requiem, which was basically a giant god inside of a jar. They go to her lab, fight Nine, who is kicking their butts, but then Nine sees Celica and she freezes for a moment, giving Ragnar the opening he needs to defeat her. However, their victory is short-lived as Izanami finds them, but Nine uses her Noxnik Taurus to freeze time around them for a few days. Izanami is frozen, but before our heroes can get caught in this same trap, Selika uses her powers to teleport everyone away, and they find themselves warped back to a small church. The exact church where Ragna, Jin, and Saya all grew up, now fully rebuilt here in the Embryo. The team takes a few days to look their wounds, realizing that as soon as Nine spell wears off, Izanami will be freed again and the world won't have much time left before it fades away. And speaking of fading away, remember, Selica wasn't really herself. She was a clone of the original Selica's soul, and because of that, she had basically been living on borrowed time, and the amount of energy that she had to exert to get everyone away from Nine's trap before they were frozen in place used up what little energy she had left. She's able to spend a few final days with Ragna and her friends, and then wishes the heroes good luck as she fades away. So, with time running out, Ragna, Jin, Noel, and Rachel all head back to Kokonoe and Kagura's headquarters. There, they're joined by Hakumen. Hakumen then reveals that the reason why this timeline has gone so differently from his is because of Noel. Noel didn't exist in his timeline. Which doesn't really make any sense, because we saw the timeline where Hakuman was Jin in the first game, and we do see him interacting with Noelle. Although, after he interacts with her, he then starts screaming out, Who are you? So, maybe the Noelle that he was seeing was Noelle from another reality? That the power of order was allowing him to see- God, this is all just too confusing! You know what, screw it, we're almost done, just go with it for now. So basically, they say Noelle is a one in a million possibility because since she was created when Takimi Kazuchi attacked the lab that she was being created in, it caused her to be born with incredibly high powers. This is why even at a young age, she was able to summon out her Noxnik Taurus. It's why when she looked into the boundary, she was granted the Eye of the Azure, and it's why out of all the Morokumo units, she's the one who was able to become a Kusanagi God Slayer. And it's because thanks to the power that was used to create her, Noelle is the Morokumo unit who is most closely linked to the original and her soul is connected with hers. Which also means that it's connected to all the other Morokumo units. So their new plan is now to go to Izanami and then have Noelle absorb Izanami into herself. So they make their way towards Izanami, but because of some very convoluted magical mishaps, the whole team gets split apart and ends up facing off with different threats. Jin and Kagura face off with Azrael, Hakumen and Tsubaki face off with Relius, Rachel is kidnapped by Hazma, and Ragna and Noel face Izanami. But there's another bit of bad news that just reared its head. You see, the Master Unit had been dragged into this world, but the Azure still existed inside the Boundary, and the Azure itself is a living thing, so it decided to activate its own defense system in response to everything that was going on. It called upon a robotic soldier from another reality, S. S is from the visual novel spin-off X-Blaze, and just like the mangas, I'm not going to get into the whole plot of them. I will say that the X-Blaze games are unique because they do provide some information on the inner workings of the Blaze Blue universe. For example, the concept of drives being something in the story rather than just a game mechanic is first explored in X-Blaze. The embryo that Izanami is building is introduced in X-Blaze. There's some more information on the boundary that's explored. However, I'll let you know right now, that's all just extra cred stuff. It's just there to fill in the nooks and crannies, and Blaze Blue is a franchise that loves to put in way too many nooks and crannies. So, yeah, check out X-Blaze if you want, but it isn't necessary to understand what's going on.
Then again, I say that as somebody who still isn't entirely sure he knows what's going on, so what do I know? What's important for now is that S had been enlisted by the Azure to clean up this world. You see, the only people that should still be alive in this world right now are the Chosen who are supposed to compete for the Azure. But because Ragnar took away everyone's dreams to keep them from going after Noel, nobody was a Chosen candidate anymore. So S was going to go up to these characters and erase them from existence. Meaning not only was the world fading away, but now the heroes themselves were all coming down with a bad case of I don't feel so good, Mr. Stark. But Ragnar and Noel were able to beat Izanami, with Noel absorbing her into herself, meaning now Noel had the memories of being Saya, making Noel, for all intents and purposes, Ragnar's sister. But little by little, the world was still being shipped away. They had to do something about the master unit. Unfortunately, New 13 pops up and Ragna has to beat her one final time. But as a result of the battle, the heroes were distracted and Yuki Terumi pops up and takes out Hakumen. Terumi then takes Hakumen's armor and hops into it himself, causing him to turn back into his original self, the Suzunoo. Suzunoo grabs Noel and the Master Yun and vanishes with them. They realize that he must have taken them outside of the embryo, into the space where their world used to exist, which is when they finally address what they've all feared. Everything outside of the embryo was gone. They hadn't just been sucked into this little tiny ball of souls and as soon as they manage to break it, they'll just go back to the real world. The real world was gone. The world they used to know had been turned into nothingness, which means they either got the master unit back and used its power to restore reality, or all was lost. Now, you might be wondering, why did Terumi take the Master Unit and Noel away? Didn't he want to kill them? Why didn't he just do that here and now? It's because even at his most powerful in the Suzunoo armor, Terumi still couldn't kill the Master Unit. But if he went back into the Boundary, then he could reach the true Azure and obtain enough power from it to destroy the Master Unit once and for all. Although, it's revealed that's not even his true plan. His true plan isn't to just destroy the Master Unit, it's to force the Master Unit to create new worlds for him that he can then keep destroying. He wants to force the Master Unit to watch him destroy her creations over and over again until the end of time. You know what, I'm just going to say it, I don't care much for this Termi fellow. He seems kinda like a jerk. Now the reason why he took Noel with him is because the true Azure was blocked off by a gate. But since Noel had the eyes of the Azure, she could open it. The Azure's guardian S tries to stop Terumi, but as Suzunoo, he was far too strong for her and easily overpowered her. So our heroes, and by that I mean the three or four of them that were still surviving at this point, had to find a way to get back into the boundary, which meant jumping into a cauldron. They head back to the cauldron in Kagatsuchi, where all of this began, only to be greeted by Hazuma. Yes, Teremi's old suit had his own plans on how to torture these heroes, and that started with Rachel, who he was holding captive. He was going to throw her into the boundary, and without her powers, the boundary would rip her very soul apart. Hazma and Ragna fight, and even though Ragna wins, Hazma still knocks Rachel into the cauldron. It looks like this is the end for her, until at the last minute, Naoto jumps in and saves her. Yeah, been a while since I mentioned him, but he's still been around. I really dig this moment for Naoto, because remember, he came to this reality looking for his friend Raquel, and even though he didn't find her, here at the very end of the game, he ends up saving this reality's version of Raquel. But that was it for Naoto. His time in this world was up, and he too ends up fading away, wishing the other heroes good luck with his final moments. And he's not the only one who's about to go away. Ragnar says goodbye to Rachel, and even though they'd spent their entire lives having a very aggressive relationship with each other, constantly hurling insults back and forth, in that moment, Rachel realizes what Ragna is planning to do. And so, the two of them drop the attitude, they drop their bickering, drop the insults, and she bids him farewell, knowing that this is the last time she will ever see him. Rachel. Ragna. <laughs> Sayonara. Ragna and Jin confront Terumi and they're able to beat him out of the Suzunoo unit. But the gate to the Azure has opened and Ragna follows Terumi inside where the two of them have their final battle. 
And there, just moments before Teremi can gain the power of a god, Ragnar takes on the form of the Grim Reaper that he had become known for, and he's able to strike down Teremi for the final time, killing him for good. So, the day has been saved. Ragnar, Jin, Noel are all one big happy family again, right? Well, not quite. There's still one problem. Ragnar knows that their world is still broken, and as long as he continues to exist, then the world will still be built around him, meaning that it could always keep looping again and again. Everyone was still trapped in a story that was written entirely around him. So he has to use the master unit to erase himself from existence. But Noelle and Jin refuse to accept this. Ragnar fought off Noelle and uses the Grimoire to steal her dreams just like he did everyone else, including the dreams of Saya and the original unit the dreams that were keeping everyone trapped in this continuous looping story. And then he finally squares off with Jin, who got the final battle with Ragnar that he always wanted, except that now, Jin was fighting to save his brother and keep him from sacrificing himself. He lost though, and in that final moment, Ragnar hugged his brother and sister as they broke down crying. It might seem out of character for Jin to suddenly care about Ragnar, but you have to remember, his whole life, he has been wanting to kill Ragnar because of his sword and because of the power of order. But they commanded Jin to kill Ragnar because he was the Black Beast, because he was a threat that had to be stopped. But now Ragnar was going to sacrifice himself. The Black Beast was no longer a threat. Meaning that when you see Jin crying here and fighting to save his brother, this is probably the first time in over a decade that Jin actually got to be himself again and actually got to show Ragnar how he really felt, that he actually did care for him as a brother. Or maybe he's just sad that he didn't get to be the one to kill Ragnar, who knows. So Ragnar left Jin and Noel with Trinity, who took them back to their world, and she even disposed of the Susanoo unit back into the Boundary, returning the thing that exposed the Boundary to mankind and kicked all this suffering off back to the darkness from whence it came. Ragnar then went to the Master Yun and spoke with Saya's dream that he had absorbed into his arm, and told Saya that he was sorry for making her wait so long. But now, it was time to finally wake up. So Ragnar used the Master Yun to erase himself from existence. All traces of him ever existing were gone, including from everyone's memories. But before he vanished, he had to create a brand new world. And that's when he revealed the other reason why he had been absorbing everyone's dreams. He channeled all the dreams he'd been absorbing into the Master Unit, and these dreams created the new world. Blaze Blue was set in a world where everything was controlled. The Master Unit controlled everyone by trapping them in a time loop, and then the events of each loop were manipulated by the Takemagahara system. Everyone was a prisoner to their fate and to the gods who were sculpting reality for them. But here at the end, Ragnar creates a brand new world with no gods to govern them, just the hopes and dreams of the people. All those things that the heroes wanted, everything that they had dreamed of, was now possible. Mankind could now finally shape the future that it always wanted. It just had to go out there and make it happen. We end our story with a look at this brand new world. Noel has quit the NOL and has gone back to the church where Saya grew up, being joined by Lambda and now helping New 13 to recover. Jin and Kagura had returned the NOL, but now they were working underneath the brand new Emperor, Hamura. Bang is joined by his clan as they all work together to rebuild Ikarga. It truly is a bright new world where everyone has a chance for a better tomorrow. Except for Carl. Uh, yeah. Carl! Carl kinda got a rough deal and it looks like they're setting him up to be the next big villain. Damn, poor Carl. But hey, everyone else turned out alright. And the story ends with Rachel looking over the sword of someone she doesn't remember. But she says that it gives her hope. And she promises that one day, she'll find who this sword belongs to. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Blaze Blue. Not including most of the mangas and spin-off games. But if you just wanted to play through the fighting games, that is the story that you need to know. So far, I've mostly just stuck to what was happening without giving my own two cents about it, but I will say, this is a story loaded with unique imaginative ideas and amazing characters, but I can't lie, it is a beast to get through, and it could easily be simplified. I mean, hell, this was the simplified version of the story. 
and I still could have cut some stuff out. It totally could have been told in a clear, more straightforward manner. It definitely has the feeling that they just kept padding more onto the story without someone there to edit or tell them to cut something out. And I'll admit, I'm not the biggest fan of most of Central Fiction's story. I love how Central Fiction ends, but I feel like going, oh, hey, we're just snapping the Infinity Gauntlet and rewinding everything, and then you all have to race to beat the God of Death sort of took the story that had been building up over the course of three games and threw a whole lot of it out. I mean, a lot of these characters have their own personal journeys, and that's one of the best things about the cast of this game. And then here at the very end, everyone is just stuck in another time loop where they don't remember anything, and then they're all just thrown into a very anime version of It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And I feel like some of that is simply because, yeah, it's a fighting game that uses sprites mean they need a reason to bring everyone back and not change them around too much. Like, when Bang takes his iconic nail and shoves it into the linchpin, that's huge. That takes away something that he had been carrying around this entire franchise. What's it going to be like for Bang to not have the Retinjo anymore? What's it going to be like for our heroes to now exist in a world that doesn't have Ars Magus? Oh, we just started up the Pocket Universe and now everything is reset. Ah, got it. Oh, Teremi is separated from Hazuma, so we don't need Hazuma in the story anymore. Wait, no, a lot of people will use him in the game, and he plays differently from Teremi, so we have to come up with some very convoluted reason to bring him back. So yeah, I can't lie, Central Fiction feels like it fell apart for me in many places. However, I still love these characters. I think they're fun, I think their character interactions are great, and while this story might be dense, it's partly because every single character has their own goals and quests, and that makes them each stand out so much more than most other fighting game characters. So even with the problems that I might have with this story, it's a great vehicle for some amazing characters. But what did you think? As I said, I wanted to make this not to be the complete 100% guide wiki on tape version of Blaze Blue. I wanted it to be a summation of the story in a way that people could understand, because damn did Blaze Blue really need a video like that. And I really hope that I was able to accomplish that. I hope someone out there who has always been curious about these games understands it better now, and maybe someone who was intimidated to get into these games because they felt that the lore was just too thick now feels like they can finally jump in and give it a try. So let me know how you felt about today's video in the comments down below. You know what, let's get a comment train going here. Everybody let me know in the comments who's your favorite Blaze Blue character. Just let me know who your favorite is and let me know why you like him in the comments down below. And if you want to follow me around the web, you can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, all at Thorgy's Arcade. And if you did like this video, then please, 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 I'm asking you very nicely here, just leave us a thumbs up, leave a comment, hit the subscribe button. As you can tell, an astronomical amount of work went into making this video, so a thumbs up would let me know that you guys appreciate it. Also, it lets YouTube know to share these videos around, so that's also nice. And if you also want to help our channel grow, then feel free to share these videos around the web. I see you guys doing that all the time, and it really does help to grow our audience. And lastly, if you want to go one step further in supporting us, we do have a Patreon now where you can vote on polls for upcoming videos and get sneak peeks at what we're working on next. Thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there, and come back next time.